You're watching the Letterman Podcast with Mike Chisholm, endorsed by the Hello Deli. Yeah! <laughs> la, 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 la. Welcome once again to the Letterman Podcast. My name is Mike Chisholm. This is a bonus episode. Uh, we've been doing a couple of bonus episodes uh, lately, uh, coinciding with uh, Dave's exit from uh, the late show anniversary, which just passed. We had Morty and then we had Rob Stover and then Morty part two. Uh, so we had a little bonus episode there with Rob. That was a great episode. Um, we're doing another bonus episode here because we, frankly, we got lots in the can right now. So, and when we have lots in the can, I have a, 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 a rule, an unwritten rule. I have no written rules. Uh, I'm flying by the seat of my pants. Um, I really don't understand that phrase. I mean, who flies by the seat of their pants? Uh, I wish I could do that. Imagine if we could fly. It doesn't matter. Um, so uh, when I I have this I have this thing in my head where it's like if I have too many in the can, it's like great. I can start putting out uh, two per week. My goal always is not to have fifty two of these things. Uh, when we started this thing, my goal was to have sixty per year. And um, now that we're kind of we hit our anniversary on April twentieth, we're into year two. I'm already trying to get some of these bonus episodes out there and uh and and get more content it's just so much fun and it's a good problem to have where i have stuff in the can ready to come out and i can't think of a more perfect episode of one that we've shot to come out as a bonus episode than this one josh robert thompson i am so excited to have him uh did he work for david letterman no Yo, yeah technically he did actually technically he worked for worldwide pants because he was a gigantic part of the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson. Um, and th those of you who have uh, reached out to me or know me or, or watch the show with any degree of regularity might have uh, uh, picked up on the fact that I really loved Craig. In fact, I would say some of my favorite, one of my favorite eras in late night television uh, was the golden age of late night television, as Dave jokingly put it to Conan O'Brien once, uh, during the years where uh, Conan had moved from late night to the Tonight Show over to Conan on TBS. I loved everything Conan was putting out at that point. Um, and for years, it was just me watching Dave then Conan. I That was my viewing habit. Uh, but then the late show with Craig Ferguson started. And that got to the point where my DVR started filling up and thank goodness, uh, because I would literally be watching three late night shows a night, uh, including one with the namesake late night. Um, but Craig Ferguson, the late, late show was an absolute delight for me. And in the evolution of that show, Josh Robert Thompson came on as a, from a bit player all the way to an essential part of that amazing in my mind uh groundbreaking in many ways uh production uh you, one of the reasons that people like late night so much late night with david letterman i should say uh, a lot of late night stuff going on here is it the era is it the show we don't know but doesn't matter a lot of people think that the late night show um one of the monikers or descriptors of it is that uh they deconstructed late night i would submit in the modern age the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson did the same thing. And the idea of a sidekick uh, was evolved because it wasn't just a sidekick. It was a ro uh, gay robot skeleton. I think Jeffrey Peterson, gay robot skeleton. Um, and, 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 and that evolved within the show. And it was so fun to watch that secretariat, the horse who would run around and, and, the, and Craig, uh, you know, you know, he really took the monologue back to the idea of opening remarks and 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 played with that as well. There were so many little deconstructions of the modern talk show uh, in 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 the project that was the Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, Josh Robert Thompson, a key key ingredient to that um, comedian, artist voice act amazing voice actor uh impressionist and um and creative uh, josh robert thompson in my viewpoint um you know equally as important to the success of the late late show with craig ferguson as craig himself was uh josh is just an awesome awesome guy we bond in so many ways including being uh, gigantic star wars fans fans of 
of many things, um, you know, that Gen Xers, you know, have found commonality with growing up. And this episode, um, you know, we did no pre-interview for this, uh, you know, <laughs> and I thought it was an absolutely incredible conversation. I'll cherish it always. Um, there's some personal stuff in there too. I have my best friend, uh, who's, who's, who's going through cancer right now. Um, and, and, and was a huge, huge fan of not just Craig Ferguson late, late, late show, but Josh Robert Thompson, he's actually the guy, uh, who, who went down the rabbit hole about Josh back in the day, real time when, when Josh was his role with the show was evolving and having Mike here with me to watch this with him. Um, it was a, it was a, I'll flat out say it. It was a dream come true for for my best friend who's going through some stuff right now. Um, that was a that was a that was a real cool thing, and and uh, it all happened organically. I adore Josh. I adore everything that he's doing. If you look at some of the antics that he's doing during the, the writer strike right now, which is as we're recording this, um, <laughs> yeah, he's he's extremely funny. Um, I implore everybody who is watching or listening to this episode to go onto YouTube and to watch the entire episode of the Josh Robert Thompson show. It was a, a, something that he created um, after uh, Late Late Show ended its run and it never got picked up. But boy, is it good. A uh, combination of characters that he created, uh, puppets and things. So so if you like Late Late Show with Craig Ferguson, you will love this because it, it's it's certainly not foreign by any stretch of the imagination, but it is certainly as unique and creative as Josh is. I highly recommend it. Um, I'll put a link to it everywhere. I, we've already put a link to it, I think, in the in the Letterman Podcast Facebook group and things. But we'll 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 do it again as this episode uh, comes out. And also, uh, we've put a link out to the fact that Josh is doing a signing for charity, um, and he's actually got like personalizations of of of, of Jeffrey Peterson stuff and Josh Robert Thompson stuff that he is signing um, and 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 sending to people. A personalized stuff that's happening June 9th. and uh, there's information about that within this. Uh, behemoth of an episode but also uh we've isolated the video and put it out there as well with the links um so i highly highly recommend anybody who is an enthusiast of the late late show to take advantage of this um opportunity to interact with a piece of yesteryear um it's neat that it's coming up because the late late show just finished its run james corden who is the, the successor to craig ferguson and company uh just finished their run and something different is going to happen at, at, at CBS. Let's see if, uh, if how successful that is, you know. Uh, but um, The Late Late Show, uh, a worldwide pants creation. And um, they did some damn fine work in all the incarnations from Tom Snyder uh, to Kilborn. And then Craig Ferguson was just an absolute, that show was just so good. It was magic. Um, and that is very evident in this episode of the Letterman podcast uh, featuring Josh Robert Thompson, please enjoy. Josh, I'm so excited to have you here. This is um, it's an honor for me to, that that you would take time out of your 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 crazy life, and it is a, it just the things that you have done just makes it a crazy life. It's so unique. Uh, the life that you've lived up to this point professionally. I can't wait to talk a little bit more about that personally and see uh, where they converge. Uh, I'm going to say this first and foremost, for those of our viewers and listeners who haven't watched uh, the Josh Robert Thompson <laughs> special, the unaired comedy special that he built that you could tell he put his heart and soul into Please go watch it. You think Jeffrey Peterson uh, and, and and all those antics on Late Late Show was awesome. They were a rabbit hole into the mind of this amazing entertainer, uh, broadcaster, um, all of these things. Josh, thank you so much for taking time out of your day to be part wow, of the Letterman Podcast for that today. What, a, what an introduction. That's Thanks for that introduction. Oh, that yeah. was really good. Uh, it's the wow. truth, man. I, I, okay, so how at the time of this recording... Um, we are at the, the, the point where the successor of the late, late show, James Corden and company are about to wrap things up and yeah. it's a good time to kind of wax philosophical about, um, about, you know, just life in general. You think about in 2014, when you guys wrapped up your run, by the way, the, the wrap up to that run was legendary as well. I just, um, do you still every day have memories of the late, late show? Yeah. I mean, uh. I, I do mostly because you, you know the, the 
followers and, and fans out there um, share such wonderful stories. I, I think, uh, especially during the uh, the lockdown and when the pandemic began, there were a whole new group of people uh, around the world that started finding the Late Late Show on YouTube. Uh, yep. People that had never heard of it before. Um, and it just kind of opened, opened the floodgates. And I think um, a video that I had posted over, I think, 11 years ago now, a video that I posted on my own YouTube channel, which is entitled Jeff Peterson Makes Craig Ferguson Cry, uh, which has gotten millions and millions and millions of views. Um, suddenly, uh, everybody found that video again. So it opened the floodgates of these wonderful, warm memories that people had and, and would share with me. And I think it really wasn't until the last couple of years that I realized, oh, wow, this is... Uh, this is like a really important show for people. Like it, it really meant a lot to people, people that watched it um, when they were kids, people that watched it uh, going to college or high school or watched it with their parents or grandparents who have since passed on or yeah. whatever. It got them through difficult times. Um, it's really amazing. So yeah, I, that that's, that's when I really do think about it when I'm reminded of it. Um, you know, the Ray Summers podcast that you were on, I, I've, I've ingested that three or four times in the last week in preparation oh, Mark, for Mark this. Summers. Mark or Mark, Summers. sorry, Mark Summers, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, I've ingested that podcast a couple of times here. And, and talking about this with you is surreal to me because listening to you and Mark talk about the nostalgia of broadcasting, like you have mm. this nostalgia in your head about all these very cool things. You're a 75 baby. I'm a 76 baby. Mm. Um, and, and, and you have this nostalgia about broadcasting, about entertainment and all of these things. And you can tell that they, they come out in the art that you create. Um, I love getting nostalgic about this late, late show to me with Craig Ferguson to me was an echo to the original late night with David Letterman in so many ways where they talked about how, you know, Letterman's show deconstructed the talk show. Well, Late Late Show took that concept, I thought, and evolved it even further. The idea of, the, you know, the introduction of puppets and and all of these, um, you know, the, the sidekick to the was 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 a was a machine, <laughs> um, mm -hmm. a, a very very well crafted machine that evolved over time. Um, yeah. Do you see, like, and I know you're a nostalgic guy when it comes to this stuff. Do you see yourself in this place of history and how how cool and how important it was to so many people, or do you? I mean, I I guess just now, maybe j only just now, uh, when you just now when you said it, just in this moment, only now did I realize. No, really, I, I just just recently, really, yeah, I um, because I, you know, I had a different experience. I I was I was on the show. I had a different perspective uh, of things. I had a great time doing that show. And you talk about classic television. You know, our show really afforded me the opportunity and a lot of us that worked on the show to meet a lot of these legendary people uh like Dick Van Dyke and nah. uh you know Bob Newhart and um I mean the, you know Carol Burnett Carol, Carol Burnett, Burnett was uh, yeah, someone yep. who came and wanted to meet me when I was doing the show and Don Rickles was another person who talked to me after anyway so it it, it really I think it was the last bastion um sort of for that golden era, you know, cause a lot of those folks are, you know, you're getting up there. Some of them have, you know, we, they've left us, but CBS also itself, CBS television city, yep. that building is steeped in TV history. So I remember the first time I walked into that building. Um, I mean, there are these murals on the, uh, in the hallways on the walls of Carol Burnett and Archie Bunker and, um, you know, Red Skelton and yeah. all of these shows, I think Judy Garland, and it goes on and on and on. So it's really something to be a part of that show, but also to have our show taped in that really historical uh, place. So in that sense, yeah, I mean, I guess I really didn't realize it, even as Carol Burnett, you know, is giving me a hug and telling me, welcome to the club, essentially. Yeah. Um, or Richard Lewis, too, God bless him. Uh, Richard Lewis um, going through some health issues right now, um, but he's such a funny, legendary comedian who, again, met me casually backstage, 
you know, doing the Richard Lewis mannerisms. Oh, let me guess. You're like, uh, what do you like? A groundlings? Uh, you just, uh, and I said, no, Richard, I, I didn't go to groundlings. I didn't do, I didn't do any of this improv training. Oh, so you like, oh, you like just some kind of some genius. You would in your basement. And I go, well, I don't know about genius, but yes, in my basement in Cleveland. So to, to be around those people, uh, for me was the best part of the late, late show. I loved performing with Craig and, and making shit up night after night. Yeah. But meeting those people, I mean, talking to Don Rickles and having Don Rickles apologize to me because he didn't understand that, that Jeff was voiced and operated by a real person. And he <laughs> said something to me like, you're a nice young man. I apologize. I got confused. It's nice to see a dummy operating a dummy. How do you like that? That's nice. <laughs> I'm glad so, you got the insult as well. Yeah, oh, that's fantastic. Kind of a beautiful thing. So yeah. so that that really yeah, so I mean that's that is what it was. It was it, to me, I had such a reverence for it that yes. uh every day that I went and went to work uh you know, I did not take it for granted. It was very special to me. Uh I'm 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 so glad to hear that. Um, that, and it makes perfect sense again, you know, getting, getting to know you, uh, through some of the interviews and things that, that, that have been put out there when you talk about you growing up and, and, and yeah, just yeah. wanting, you know, the influences that you clearly, clearly had uh, a variety show influences. And again, when you watch, yeah. and I, I cannot rave enough about your special, uh, that, that you crowdfunded and had made, it was Thank such you. a beautiful beautiful piece you can tell where all these influences came from yeah um i want to yeah. talk about that i want to talk about george lucas i want to talk about all these sorts of things that you oh. do that are just hysterical <laughs> uh, but i want to talk about you as well because at the same time here we are waxing philosophical about these cool things that happened and and, and you were part of broadcasting history i want to go back into that of course talking about the pants of it all the worldwide pants of it all and, mm. and, and these yeah. things but i want to ask about you before we get into any of that because i'm fascinated by it um do you have like where you're at now, seven and a half years later, eight years later, um, talking about where things are at in your career right now? Number one, what are you doing? Number two, uh, are you at a crossroads of sorts uh, as to where you're at? And and how are you dealing with that? Yeah, wow, well, that's how much time do you got? We got time uh, okay. as much as you want. Any this is going to be your longest to be our longest show. Uh, you no, know, <laughs> I am at a crossroads and um. I think it's a pretty normal thing that happens with any, uh, well, with all people, really. But with particularly if you're a creative person, if you're an artist of some sort, mm -hmm. uh, you do come to that point where you start to think, like, is this is this really what I want to do for the rest of my life? Um, and I I love doing voiceover stuff. I mean, don't get me wrong. As Mark Summers said, uh, it sure beats working for a living. Uh, <laughs> but you know, and I kind of fell into it. You know, I, I did do voices a lot when I was a kid and I did uh, record voices into my Fisher Price tape recorder and I did make yep. radio plays and things with my friends. So this is something that I've been doing my entire life. And I did build talk show sets, The Tonight Show, a, a version of The Tonight Show out of, you know, refrigerator boxes in my mm -hmm. basement. So So I have been doing all this, but I think I kind of fell into the voiceover thing. Um, what I really wanted to do was make films and uh, and and write, you, you know, write write books and um, and so that's what I am first and foremost to me because I know who I am. I I've been me for forty eight years. I I always see myself as a writer and a, and a filmmaker. Wow. Um, but I kind of ended up in these other things. But the nice thing is. I've done okay at those things. And so that affords me the time to then work on those other things. So, right. um, but that's kind of where I'm at because, you know, I, I don't want to, you know, I don't, I, I'm not complaining about it. I always have to preface this because there'll always be somebody, <laughs> there's always going to be somebody on Twitter or something that will say, you know, I heard that interview and you really should be grateful. <laughs> Calm down, grandma. I'm very <laughs> grateful for the things I have. It's going to be okay. But, you know, I don't necessarily want to do uh, impressions of other people for the rest of my life. Like, I don't think of myself as an impressionist. Right? You're not Rich and, Little. Right. I don't, 
that's not me. Like I grew up watching Rich Little. Yeah. Speaking of variety shows, I mean, that guy was all over every variety show during during the day, you know, when we were growing up. Yep. But but there are other people uh, that I know. Um, Jeff Richards is one of them. Joe Gaudet, Piat Michael. There, there are these other people, um, Christina Bianco, uh, Rachel Butera. There are all these people that do impressions and they're really good at it. Melissa Villasenor. Um, oh, yeah. And that's yep. what they do. That's like, that's their thing. They're they're um, very skilled at it. Mm -hmm. and, and they do other things, but they really focus on that. And I realized maybe in the last three years or so, it just wasn't that exciting to me anymore. It just wasn't like, I love doing Family Guy. I've been doing Family Guy for <laughs> 13 seasons now. And anytime they want something like, hey, can you do, it could be, you know, it's, hey, can you do a Tom Selleck? Sure, I'll figure it out. Yep. Beca it's because of, it's because of the people I work with. It's because I respect them and I enjoy working with them. Yep. And it doesn't feel like a, it doesn't feel like a dance for us monkey kind of thing. Anyway, I, you know, so I, I started to think like, okay, it's just not really what I want to do. It's not the number one thing I should say. It's like right. maybe not in the top five. And yeah. I've learned to sort of keep that to myself because weirdly when you tell <laughs> followers or fans that that's the truth of your own life, uh, people sometimes people get very upset. And, uh, you know, listen, I if if Craig called me and was like, Josh, listen, so we're going to get the band back together. <laughs> And you're going to be Jeff uh, and we're going to get the horse. I'd say, sure, man. Sure. <laughs> However, how much, how much are we, how much money are we talking? No. Um, <laughs> but I, you know, because I'm a different person now. Right. I mean, that, that show, our show ended. Was it eight, eight years ago? Now, eight years ago now. Yeah. I've, you know, I've done other things since then. I have a different perspective on who I am. I have different concepts of like what I want now in my own career. And I think for a while it was in my mind, it was, well, you, you're the, you go behind the wall and you're the yeah. guy and we don't, nobody wants to see you. You know, I think when that, when that TV special I made didn't sell, I mean, for a while I was like, okay, well, I guess. I guess maybe that's it for me. You know, you kind of go through that, but, but that's where I'm at now in a more positive sense. Now I'm, I'm working on other projects uh, and I don't feel that desperation that I think a lot of young performers have. And I had it, especially with social media where you feel this need to post all the time, every day, constantly, yep. or else there's this fear that you're going to just float away into the ether and no one will care. I like the old school idea of I'm going to go away for a while. Yeah. You guys will all think I'm dead, which a lot of people do, apparently, especially on Facebook. They always go, are you still working? Which I love. Oh. But it's fine because because I like that, because actually I can go and do these things. And then when I'm ready, I will, you know, present those things, whether it's a book or a film or whatever. But that's the stuff that really excites me now. That's the stuff that gets me. I mean, this whole room is these are all, you know, horror films. And, uh, you know, classic movies and over here, I've got all my VHS tapes and my King Kong poster, my gorilla at large with <laughs> uh, Anne Bancroft. And, you know, I got all this stuff in here. This is my this you're you're inside my mind right now. This is it, yep. you know, yep. and um, but boy, I really love that uh, people remember this show. And God, it's 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 incredible. It really is. So. You know, you can I have love, both. You can do well, both. That, I was just gonna say, I love the mixture of of, of both, and and it's so yeah. funny. Like like you talk about with you know with Dave, for example, I use that as the as as the barometer for for everything because it is the Letterman podcast. I mean, uh, there are some pure you know folks who would consider themselves purists. Uh, they only liked late night and and when it got yeah. to late show and it went real big and all that stuff, there are some people who like the entire body, but then when he moved to my next guest doing long form, you know, it took them a while to kind of get used to something new. And I think yeah. that that's a human condition. Many times, um, you know, it takes, it takes a moment 
Uh, it takes a beat or two to get used to something new for some from something that's familiar. Uh, you know, music. Any music fan will tell you that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, when it, you know, when an when a, when a, when an act that you love decides to go in a new direction, mm -hmm. um, you know, you got to come in there with an open mind. But many times that open mind will be rewarded with an extension of the love of that person's body of work. Yeah. Again, I go back to your to your special because I want to ask you about that. Mm -hmm. um, to me. When I look at the transitions between all of the different things, the character you created uh, of 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 Josh Robert Thompson in the ship, um, and 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 all of the different uh, you know muscles that you flexed in that, and I'm talking not just in front of the camera, but it seems like behind the camera as well. Uh, did you did you birth that thing? Like, was it really really personal in that time and place when it came out of your mind? You know, I talk about how my wife cooks with love all the time. This thing felt like it was built with love. Um, yeah. Is that what that was for Definitely. you? Definitely. Yeah. I mean, I, I'm glad you said in that time and place, because yeah. I, when I look at it now, I mean, like anything, it's just like anything. You look at something you did years ago and you go, well, I don't know if I would have done this, this and this. And uh, yeah, I've, since, I've, since yeah. re, I've since recut it. Uh, thankfully, uh, I cut some things out before I unleashed it uh, onto the world because I can't imagine what would happen now but um you know i i that was all that was that was just this thing that um the late late show was about to end yep craig called me personally um to tell me that uh he was making the decision to step down and i believe he was on the set of the show hot in cleveland i think yep. he was he was getting his makeup done and he thought, I'll give Joshi a call and see what happens. He called me Joshi. And um, <laughs> so listen, man, I've decided that, you know, the show is going to be over, but you know, you're going to be fine, man. Don't worry. So that was very nice of him. So when he called me to say that, I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to do something here. I'm going to, I'm going to make something that, um, you know, is a showcase really uh I, I call it now the world's most expensive um demo reel uh <laughs> it is a very good demo reel um, it certainly is if you got 20 minutes please but um yeah yeah that's what it was it was it really was as you said earlier it was my um sort of tribute to all the variety shows that i grew up with as a kid and also, maybe even uh, some of the kids shows like mr rogers i was a big yep. fred rogers fan me too Fred Rogers was really one of those. I wish I could have met him. And uh, he was he was, a you know, a broadcasting pioneer, really. I mean, this guy was a Presbyterian minister who also studied child psychology and had figured out for 30 years how to do this show that never changed once, never deviated nope. from its style through all those very significant eras when TV was changing very rapidly. Um and uh, Jim Henson as well, you know, my love of yeah. uh, the Muppets and particularly the weirder, you know, Dark Crystal and the Jim Henson Hour and uh, the Labyrinth and all of that. Yep. Yeah. Very strange, really dark, um, groundbreaking technology pushing stuff. And of course, George Lucas. And um, yeah. so we kind of, you know, that whole show. For what that show cost. Uh, we probably, we probably, if I did it again, we would probably write a script of some sort. Um, but all we had was an outline and a couple wow. bucks and, um, and an incredible team of people that I worked with years prior in, uh, public access, uh, or local TV. Yeah. And so I just gathered this kind of motley crew of very talented people and we just threw stuff at the wall and saw what stuck and uh and that became the show uh, the concept of the show was um not even figured out until until the editing stage we uh, we came up with this idea that maybe they were flying through space in this ship the conceit was that uh my my character a, a very uh well it was kind of me at the time yeah i had i had been uh drinking quite a bit at the time. So if you go back and watch the show, uh, old Joshy's face is a little, uh, little, little puffier. Puffy. Little yeah. Puffy. yeah. Uh, you know, but I, it was like an angrier 
darker version of me and uh, but as Mr. Rogers, like if yep. he were an alcoholic uh, or Dean Martin, you know. Oh, yeah. And, there was um, a really nice little layer of pretentiousness that you had uh, in, in, in alongside the goofiness. It was yeah. fantastic. Yeah. Yeah. Very, very, and, very good. And there were scenes we cut out where I was very mean to my uh, puppet friends on board. <laughs> I, there were a couple of scenes, I think, where I was like poking them and really giving them shit. And even my director, Kamel Alloway, he's like, yeah, maybe let's do another one and maybe, you know, be a little kinder, be nicer. And I was like, right, nice, right. Because I was not in that space at that time. But um, the conceit was that I, that, uh, I was some guy who'd got tired of life on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. Very timely. And um, <laughs> I hijacked, I hijacked um, a European, a famous gangster. It was Gary the Ogre was this intergalactic European gangster. And I stole his ship. And so the whole plot was Gary, this ogre character with these horns that, you know, look like penises on his head. <laughs> he talks like this. Hey, guys. And he he was chasing me through outer space. But along the way, we would pick up friends um, we were trying to do more episodes and like Craig Ferguson would have been, um, an astronaut who was lost. He was adrift and we picked him up. So we just pick up stragglers, celebrities. Perfect. And, uh, that was going to be the show. So, you know, we, we, and we shot it like in a couple, like a week. Yeah. Uh, and boy, I, I'm so proud of it. I'm proud of it because the people that came together to make that thing. This was the second pilot I made. This was I had made another one a year before that. And I I was not very happy with that. But this one I just love. I mean, yeah. the work uh, this guy, Sam Barnett, um, was a stop motion animator and he did some incredible stop motion stuff in there. He, so also he did the taco stuff. then he did the taco. Yeah, he yeah. did taco the talking yeah. taco. Yeah. Um, which, you know, when we shot it, there was nothing there. Yeah. We had to just pretend. And then my friend John Shevsky uh, did the voice of Taco. Um, the Carl Sagan stuff, you know. <laughs> so good. Really proud of that. We had an incredible makeup team that, you know, really they, they got the hair and everything. I think it was uh, Kara, Kara Liedlich was the the one who did the the hair and everything. And even this little appliance that sort of gave me this Carl Sagan brow i mean that stuff i just love it's so weird and yeah so when late late show fans saw that um especially the preacher character oh, so um good. which is my is just my favorite yeah um they really didn't know they didn't know what to do with any of that you know and i understand you know but <laughs> i don't know man i i watched it again today um and 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 <laughs> like I look at what's on Netflix these days and when I see like yeah. I think you should leave when I yeah. see that it's like okay imagine that with some production value and some 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 real creative directions and, and it's like oh my gosh I want to see this today now this yeah. is the question I have for you mm -hmm. this is something that you shot a long time ago where your mind was in a different place mm -hmm. somebody discovers this today and says hey JRT, let's make this happen. Uh, do you say yes? Or are you like, no, I'm past that now. I'm in a different spot. Yeah, I don't know. That's a good question. I, I, I would say let's take, I would say let's take some things from that show. Okay. Um, like I had a whole, uh, Joseph Bolter, who was the, the front of the horse, he, who was secretariat. <laughs> yeah. And also a, a great writer and went on to, um, produce Craig's last Netflix uh, or it was like a, it's a yep. comedy special yep. um, slash documentary. Yep. Um, he, he and I, you know, I was working on a show that was a, a, a pilot for the Reverend Apostle BG. And it was, uh, I was, and I still would love to do it, but yeah. what happened was, um, and this is an example of how ridiculous this business is. And you should really never listen to anybody unless it's like Steven Spielberg, you know, um, <laughs> yep. because I had a lot of people telling me no one's going to go for a show about a televangelist and nobody is going to buy that. And that's a passe idea. And it's very eighties. And then um, as we're through the middle of writing this pilot, uh, Danny McBride, uh, I was gonna say on HBO with, uh, righteous gemstones. And so <laughs> we, I put that away and sort of, <laughs> linked away into the darkness but um 
But I love the re the Reverend Apostle BG comes out of public access TV. Yeah, he was actually based on um, he was based on an old a boss of mine uh, that I worked for at, at the cable company when when it was Adelphia Cable. And my friend Raymond Chavez Jr., the late Raymond Chavez Jr., and I uh, worked for Public Access TV. Yeah. And our boss was this guy named Bill Green. And he said, hey, man, what's <laughs> up, man? And he was always rubbing his hands together. Hey, dude, get in here, man. You're in big trouble, man. Close the door, man. And then you'd close the door and he'd say, that was pretty good, man. Did you buy it? Do you think they bought it, man? Shut down, man. How you been, man? He was the, he was the greatest supervisor I ever had in my life. I love that guy. And so we, for our company meetings, these quarterly meetings, we had to, our task was to come up with quarterly uh, meeting presentations. Yeah. Basically, it was always at like seven in the morning. This is out in Ontario, California, which is just like in the middle of nowhere. It's in a place called the Inland Empire. And Home uh, of the LA Kings farm team, the Ontario Reign, by the way. Is that right? The Ontario That's right. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't know. Big that. Canadian, right? Big hockey fan. And I'm a big Kings uh, fan. Yeah. So yeah, Ontario <laughs> Rain, go Rain. Nice man. Uh, well, we had the what was the the Kuk the Earth the Quakes. I think there was the 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 Rancho the Cucamonga Quakes Quakes or something like that. Anyway, <laughs> yeah, but the, but we uh we had to do these meetings at seven o'clock in the morning out in the middle of nowhere, and basically it was a meeting room, a giant meeting room with very depressing fluorescent lighting. And about, you know, 300 very tired and disgruntled uh, cable installer people. Mm -hmm. These guys just <laughs> wanted to get to work, get through their day, got all of my equipment, and we got our trucks outside, and we're ready to go. And you guys are here putting on a little dog and pony show. So we would, so what we, you know, we, Raymond and I loved those guys. We were friends with all those guys. And we decided to make it fun for them because, yeah. you know, these meetings were very stuffy and very boring. And it was a lot of like, let's take a look at the quarterly numbers. Uh, not doing so well. Direct TV is really clobbering us in the, uh, you know, this was like, this was like 2004, you know, yeah. 2003. So we started just doing these videos uh, where I would play Bill Green and I put on a bald skull cap because he had like wispy hair. And he'd look, he'd look at my version of him. He'd watch the video and say, that's cold, man. That's cold. You guys, you guys suck, man. That's <laughs> funny though, but that's cold, man. So it would be Bill Green in these quarterly meeting videos played by me walking around, just kind of interviewing different employees in their cubicles. Um, and eventually Raymond and I came up with this idea of uh, what if Bill all of a sudden uh, calls us into his office for a meeting and uh, decides to pull a Bible out of his desk, out oh. of his desk drawer. Yep. And it would, but it was called scripture quoting green. So it was such a stupid idea, but it was like, <laughs> no matter what the problem was, he'd say, yep. now, wait a second. Now, did you say, now, what did you say? H how many miles did you put on the company van? Well, I think it was probably, uh, you know, uh, about 150 150 miles. Okay. You know what? Let's, let's see what scripture says about that. And it, and then he would go, now it's right here. Oh, Leviticus and Leviticus says any employee of Adelphia who drives 150 miles <laughs> has to pay. And then, and I'd say, wait, where is that in Leviticus? And he'd close the book. Oh, oh, I, oh, I lost the page. I lost the page, but it's in there, but it's in there. And that's, and that's how, uh, this preacher, came to be the, the reverend apostle bg was was my old boss and also robert duvall in the movie the apostle absolutely one of my favorite movies of all time yep and also i grew up uh in cleveland i grew up and i, I uh, my grandmother would take me to her uh church on sundays if you spent the day with grandma you could go to chuck e cheese and you definitely would go to mcdonald's and you definitely go to Mally's Chocolates and have a giant, you know, ice cream sundae. After order, church, of course. After church, you're going to yes. have to go to church. And yeah. it was a Pentecostal church. So, like, they spoke in tongues. Yeah. You know, they, they gave out little thimbles of wine and these tiny wafers. And the preacher, uh, this guy passed away many years ago now. And I all respect this guy, Pastor, Pastor Canfield. 
<laughs> we used to call him Caster Panfield. Of course. I don't know. We were a bunch of idiots, but I used to call was... George Lucas Lord Jukas. So Lord Jukas. We well, we that's that makes sense. You know, that's Caster well, Panfield. There it is. Yeah. Well, <laughs> but that you know that watch it. So to me, the whole point of this is that preaching. I think preaching is the most uh the oldest and most purest um most pure form of improv that there yes. is yes oh gosh uh, you know and when i saw that i didn't think i didn't want i didn't want to become a man of god i wanted to you know tell jokes and make shit up on stage yep. but but the way that this guy did it was so impressive and he would just hold the audience the congregation in the palm of his hand you could take one line one sentence from the bible Yep. and spin a yarn for an hour and they'd be captivated. So, so that, that would be the show I would do. That would, that would be the show I would do. I'm in, take my money. Um, my, okay, my, man. my favorite part of, of his, because you, you know, in the, in the, in the, um, uh, in the special, uh, you interlace him throughout, throughout the show. And, and, and my favorite part, uh, was when he, had his arm on the guy and he was making him uncomfortable and he understood, <laughs> yeah, he understood yeah. there was a power struggle happening right now. And yeah. he's got his arm and he's like, you only get that authenticity from actually experiencing it and seeing that there's mm -hmm. a power shift. There's a, like you encapsulated it perfectly and comedically. Um, I want to go to the timeline here because, yeah. you know, that's Oh four ish. Um, uh, when you're in the studio doing this and, and these mm -hmm. things are kind of bubbling up to the surface. Oh seven. You're, at Craig Ferguson. Like it's yeah. not that long between those times. Now there's a period of time where you're calling into the Howard Stern show as, uh, as, as, as then governor Schwarzenegger. Yeah. That's, um, and that's before that, that, that would have started. Okay. Yeah. That would have started around. Well, whatever the first, the, their first day on Sirius XM or their second day on Sirius XM, when Howard made the switch, I felt like that was 05, 06, but anyway, yeah. 06. Um, oh, maybe you're right. You're right. No, I, the first time I started the Stern show was probably 2002. Yeah. Because I they had flown me out there to do a uh, segment of the show called Win a Date with Tabitha Stevens, an adult <laughs> film star, Tabitha Stevens, who was a very sweet woman. And um, it was me on the panel as fake Arnold because I, ha I had yeah. been calling into the show as fake Arnold. Right. Um doing little bits here and there. I, I don't remember what the first bit was, but um, Tim Conway Jr. Um, I had been doing Tim Conway Jr. and Doug Steckler's radio show uh, yeah. on LA radio. 97.1 FM was a was the LA talk station. That's what they called themselves. Talk radio on FM. And Doug Steckler you know, was a writer for SCTV, which is one of my favorite shows in the world. Growing Absolutely. Up, right? So now I'm a Canadian. They make us watch it in elementary school as we grew yeah, that's, up. So. That's, that's, that's uh, required watching. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. The kids in the hall and SCTV. Absolutely. Yeah, you've got to have that. I uh, <laughs> no that, that was the show I always gravitated toward more so than SNL. Yeah. Um, but but when I met Doug Steckler, I was just beside myself because I had the SCTV book that um dave thomas had written years ago mm -hmm. and so i had him autograph it and uh you know there's a little picture of him in there and so these guys had this kind of old school show a radio show and one day i decided to just call in as arnold um <laughs> hey guys how are you it's arnold how are you doing you know because he was running you know he's running for governor well actually it was before that and then he ran for governor and it was like the most amazing thing that could have ever happened <laughs> um because suddenly i was doing all these radio shows but tim conway jr is the guy who recommended me to gary baba buoy delabate over at the wow. howard stern show because i i cut my t i did the conway and Seckler show i cut my teeth on that for like like a year i i was calling in almost every other night doing bits as Arnold Schwarzenegger had no idea what I was doing. I had note cards that I would spread out on my desk that had different phrases and different jokes and different words that Arnold would say. Cause I just, I was so nervous. I didn't know what the hell I was doing. I really wanted to impress these guys. Mm -hmm. And, um, and, but out of that came the, you know, the Stern show. So that was, uh, 
it was kind of an amazing thing, man. The thing that I want to talk about here is like, uh, like I'm a personal development guy. I love, I love this, that kind of stuff. And, and, and I think I'm, I think I'm a bit of a, a, you know, a result of personal development. Jim Rohn used to say, you feed your family during the day and you work on your fortune at night. And I love the idea that you're doing these, you know, cable access show stuff and, and these things, but then you're also making the steps to do something bigger that is more close to the calling of your heart. Yeah. I love that. Um, and, and you just see where it goes. Um, this yeah, show is I an didn't know. I didn't know. I had no idea. Like when I was doing Conway and Steckler, I was, yes. I, so I had quit. I was working. I, w I went to, uh, Cal state, uh, Fullerton yep. and got my useless degree in uh, TV, radio and film. And by the way, it was a communications degree, but when it came to graduation, this, they, they, somebody asked me, what do you want it to say on your diploma? It can say communications, or it could say TV, radio, and film. I said, yeah, that sounds better. So that's what's on my <laughs> diploma. I didn't take a film class. I think I walked out of the guy's film class because he was an a-hole. And yep. uh, I never took a radio course either. So <laughs> you know, sure, sure. By the way, David Letterman, communications student as well. Yeah, oh, there you go. See? There and go. Yeah. And they went out to be a weatherman. And, you know, so it all yeah. worked out. It all worked out. You know, but that, but to me, um, I learned more uh, about television and production by just volunteering at this TV studio. This is when I moved from Cleveland. I moved from Cleveland to LA. Um, it was uh, 1995, late, late. And that 95. was fortuitous, right? Like your parents made that move. This wasn't you striking out on your own and going there. You yeah. moved with the family, right? Yeah. My dad had gotten a, um, you know, promotion that required him to move to California. He was going to be the regional manager of this company. And, how fortuitous was that? I said, wow. well, yeah, I don't want to be in Cleveland. I, uh, no, all due respect, Cleveland, relax. I love you guys. But yeah, uh, you guys rock. Yeah. I mean, honestly, I I if it if it weren't for for Cleveland television, I don't think that I would have gotten into the stuff I did because, you know, we, Cleveland, I think at one time we had like five or six late night uh horror movie hosts. You know, we yeah, that was our thing, right? So we had Goulardi, Ernie Anderson in the 60s, father of Paul Thomas Anderson, yeah. whose film company is Goulardi Films. Yeah. And um, so my parents had Goulardi. And then when I grew up, I had the ghoul, son of ghoul, uh, Frank and Drac, Big Chuck and Little John. Uh, Elvira was syndicated yeah. and super host. So it was like, God, that was like the greatest thing in the world to watch those late night shows and those crappy horror movies. And of course, thanks to them, I probably have every one of the films that I watched as a kid. That's I spend the rest of my adult life tracking those things down and going, what was that one? There was a movie. I know there was a movie about a guy that when he shouted, it would make everything die around him. I know there was a movie about a guy. He, he would scream. Uh, what was it called? What was it? Oh, it was called The Shout. Oh, that's right. And it's like this well-respected <laughs> film that stars John Hurt and Alan Bates. And it's a masterpiece. And here it is on Criterion Channel yep. like six months ago. And I'm like, this is the movie that Big Chuck and Little Joe. Hey, gang, we got a real corker for you. It's this crappy movie called The Shout. But I only saw it one time. I only saw it mm -hmm. once when I was... 11 years old, only one time at my friend Jack's house. I remember we were sitting there. I remember this because his dad was laid up. He was, his dad was in a lazy boy, the recliner. He he had casts on his arms and legs because his dad had gotten in like a horrible um, snow snowmobile uh, accident, right? So yep. his dad's sitting there propped up. Hey, let's watch a little uh, Big Chuck, a little John. And so it's like, you know, midnight and I'm sitting there with Jack. It's probably summer of 86. And these yahoos are playing uh, this movie, The Shout. And I was like, this movie's weird. It's boring, but something about it. And I never forgot about it. Of course, I have like three versions of it and the poster somewhere around here. So that, that's a scene out of a Coen Brothers movie right there. Um, yeah, that's it is. just amazing. amazing. But that's uh, but I owe it. But that's, you know, that that local TV spirit. Yep. I, I miss it so much. And that's probably why I gravitated toward public access. So when I moved, yeah. we moved to Chino, which by the way, folks, it, again, <laughs> all due respect to Chino, it's in the middle of nowhere. It's not <laughs> Los Angeles. Okay. <laughs> it's cows. And then there's the men's prison. Okay. <laughs> went up to Chino. That's like, you know, in a song. So 
so the cable studio, the public access studio was like a Wayne's world, uh, yeah. or, or UHF. It was like, it was like the TV studio out of UHF, the weird Al movie, right? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Yep. And I mean, it was in this cul-de-sac that was tucked away in the, in the middle of this barren field, which was just littered with radio towers as far as the eye could see. Wow. And it, and it was this magical place in the middle of nowhere. And yep. that's where um, I learned how to use all this equipment that at that point was already, you know, uh, 15, 20 years old. All the cameras yeah. and the, the, you know, the three quarter inch decks and the the control room, everything. And I made my own late night horror show. I hosted a late night monster movie show for a while in Chino that maybe five people watched. But that's how uh, that's how the Late Late Show found me. Um, one of the writers of the Late Late Show was, you know, watched me do my apostle and uh, emailed me. It was like, what else do you do? And I'm yeah. like, well, it's funny you mention that. So then we started doing the Schwarzenegger stuff. So, so really, I guess the point what, what we're saying here is. None of this was by design. This was kind yep. of the important thing. Like, just I do would, and just stuff do happens. It. Yeah, because, yep. but it's got to be, it has to be because you enjoy it. Yes. That's why, to be very honest with you, that is why I stopped. I mean, I haven't done like Reverend Apostle BG. It's it's been it's been about four years. Um, I, I was I was doing all these live shows and a podcast, and I was just. Yep. I was, I was desperate. I was doing it for all the wrong reasons. I was trying to get views and I was trying to get followers and it just wasn't working. And I was very unhappy and I was, you know, I was very, taking it all very personally when like the pilot didn't sell and when, yeah. you know, Righteous Gemstones came. So, um, but now the stuff I'm working on, which, which will be out at some point, um, you know, I enjoy it a lot. You you have you have to just enjoy what you're doing. You do. Yep. You really do. And and my dream is to someday in 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 the alternate dream future, I would have enough money to buy that warehouse that's now empty where the TV studio once was in Chino. I would I would buy that place and I would make it into a studio again and I would drive I would be up every day if that was my if I could just do that for the rest of my life and sustain myself, I would get up every morning and drive out to Chino and I would just make shit with my friends. I would rent it out for people to use, you oh know, because local TV is very important, man. You just gave me goosebumps. I, yeah. uh, <laughs> it, no, no, seriously, Josh, I swear to God. Um, and OK, we're going to get to some Letterman stuff. We're going to get to some pants. Yeah, stuff, sorry. Everybody. Yeah. Just, worldwide. No, pants, no, no, just, Letterman. Worldwide. No, pants. we will. We will. But but this after you, when you and I started corresponding and I started, you know, kind of prepping for this, um, what you just said right there is exactly what I was hoping this conversation would lead to. I want to know what you would love to do now. And I love that it's create. I love that it's on a bigger scale, a different scale. And yeah. it's a bigger scale in your mind because of it's what's important to you, not what's important to the demo or where, where things are going when it comes yeah. to these things. I love that. And, um, yeah, you know, I've got, yeah, it's gotta be, you gotta do that because it's, um, it's beautiful. You know, it's just I, like, I can see it. I can see it. And oh, be, because I, because like I said earlier, when we started talking, yeah. At the top of the conversation, I, I I already know who I am. I already know the things I like. And yep. if you said to me, "All right, it's either doing impressions for the rest of your life, or it's making less money but working in this studio or making a making films," I'd say, "Well, I'm going to take that one because I have to." If I may, just like you talked about learning all, uh, uh, becoming an expert on all of this antiquated gear, mm. right? That's a tool that you have in your tool belt, in your mental tool belt. The impressions also a tool that you have in your, your Absolutely. tool belt, but that's not what you do for a living. They're just things that contribute yeah. to the greater picture of art that you want to create. Mm -hmm. And then that, that drives you from, from inside the thing that really gets you going and gets you excited. Um, if, if you don't mind, is that, is that an accurate? Absolutely. Yeah. In fact, I was just talking to talking with Craig about this. This is something that Craig had actually said to me when we were on tour many years ago, because yeah. I, even, even then I was starting to feel like, eh, I don't really want to be 
the Morgan Freeman guy. You, know, you came to my it, town. I was at that. I was at that show with my best friend, who's sitting here watching Happier Than a Pig yeah. and Shit, watching us right now. You guys were awesome, and you were a fantastic opening act for Craig Ferguson on stage. Just fun. so thank you know, you. here are some people who really appreciated that tour. So thank you oh, for doing that. You. When yeah. was that? Where, where where was that? I I it would have been I I well, Kelowna, British Columbia. Is oh yeah, where okay. I'm from. That's that's where we're from. Oh, that was a great show. Yeah. I remember that. I do oh, remember that. Do. You know what? I we do. shouted out of the audience. Um, we actually shouted right before Craig told the golf joke at the end. Mm -hmm. um, we actually shouted out of the audience to him. And we said, hey, Craig, if Jeffrey Peterson uh, was hanging on the side of a cliff and Secretariat was hanging on the side of a cliff and you could only save one, which one would it be? And the whole audience went, ooh. <laughs> and Craig disarmed it so quickly. What the fuck are you guys talking about? It's a show. Yeah, yeah. This is that. It was, he went down a great direction to answer the question. That's great. But, but, but it was, it, you know, we just, it, oh, Kelowna. Yeah, I remember. No, it was a great, great show. No, I do. I actually, was it a theater? It was a theater, right? Yeah, community theater. Right. I remember that very well. I really Holy do. Holy crap. I, yeah, because, because I remember the vibe uh the vibe there was i felt like a, a rock star i felt like uh oh wow they actually get they're actually under they're getting my weirder i think i did probably did some apostle stuff i don't remember if i did or not but um do you still have video of that of any of that Mike? oh god no <laughs> okay well i think we got some video of it we'll we'll send it to you yeah this because i think uh, i think when we were in the, sort of the Canada portion of the tour. Um, yeah. I that's when I started thinking, and also when I worked in the UK, I did some uh, commercials in the UK, and uh, I remember really appreciate. I mean, we're talking about SCTV. We're talking about you know yeah. that. I go, oh, oh, this is this is more. These are my people. This is more. I think comedy wise, I think, oh, they really get it in a way that maybe. And now, obviously, there were certain portions of Canada where uh you know is a bit more uh uptight and uh which was also sure. hilarious they weren't going for any of that but but I <laughs> but yeah it's it's interesting the the sensibilities the comedic sensibilities uh, are very are vastly different and, uh, uh, very much so we talked about that with Paul a little bit too like the idea of 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 Canada we've got this unique uh, set of circumstances up here where we're the little brother uh, to the north. Um, yeah. You know, so there's the inferiority complex. The weather's different. So many times we're inside and we're like, there's a strangeness. I don't know if you've watched Letter Kenny or some of these different things that are coming out of Canada now, but yeah, I, and I, there's a sensibility that seems to do really well when it goes down south and it clicks in the right place. Saturday Night Live being, uh, yeah. you, know, a, you know, being being or the early version of Saturday Night Live. That, I think it extends it. to films as well because I do have um, back there somewhere. I have a number of um, shot on video yep. films that are part of a collection of. Uh, now this is what they call it. Uh, Canucks Canucks exploitation is that right? <laughs> There's let's get t-shirts. That sounds great. I mean, it is a whole <laughs> era of film from the late '80s, early '90s, shot okay. on video, Canadian horror films, and they are just exquisite. It makes me so <laughs> happy because because that you know that's what I was doing too in in the late '80s. Um, I started making uh, horror movies. I started making monster movies in my yeah. backyard in Cleveland. And yeah. uh, my mom was the, was the camera person on two of those epic films. And um, there was something in the air at that time. There were a lot of people, the Polonia brothers, uh, John and Mark Polonia, that now, you know, they have a, they, they, they make all these Amityville uh, sequels now that you yeah. can readily find on Amazon prime and <laughs> any shark versus movie is mostly going to be Mark Polonia. Um, but they made a movie called Feeders back in 1996 that came out, I believe, one week before a little movie called Independence Day. Um, <laughs> and I know this because I was working at Blockbuster Video at the time, and yep. I remember putting this movie on the shelf. I have it now here on VHS. It's one of my my proudest possessions. And um, I watched that movie, and I went, okay, wow. So there's other people... There's other people out there just grabbing a camera and making a movie. And yeah. and that really is what we're talking about. You know, don't worry about what anybody thinks.
because yep. my God, that's really all it's sort of become, at least to me, the social media thing is just constantly like seeking approval and taking polls. And what do you guys think? And how do you think my movie should yep. end? Look, yeah. all due respect, I don't really give a shit if what you think or how my movie, you know, let me let me do it the way I want to do it. Because if we didn't, we never would have George Lucas or David Lynch or, you know, any of these people, really. I mean, yep. so so that's kind of uh, that's kind of a beautiful thing, man. Yeah. Can exploitation. I'll have to take a, <laughs> have to find the box and. Oh, you. we're uh, I'm I'm going to, uh, you know, insist or even demand that we're going to to be continue this. Are we good for a little more time? Can we yeah, have of course? Yeah. Time? Awesome. Sure. Amazing. Um, that's great. You know, um, <laughs> I said that to Jeff Martin. He was an original late night writer and went to The Simpsons and all sorts of stuff since then. And uh, and we ended up going three hours like like I love going deep wow. on this stuff. I, you are a brother from another mother. I mean, just the George Lucas rabbit hole we could go down. <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. I, oh, my God. You impersonating George Lucas at the Whoa. Star Wars celebration with a Greedo shot first. Uh, but I love something that you said yeah. about Phantom Menace uh, or the prequels. Uh, but Phantom Menace being one of them, you said oh, it recently. Yeah. How, how, how those films like experimental George Lucas basically get himself a bankroll enough where he could go, I'm going to make Star Wars into experimental movies and yeah. I'm going to push te technological boundaries like we did back in the 70s and, 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 and stories and things like that. And, and people might not get it now, but it doesn't matter. I'm going to make what I want to make. Yeah, you know, you dressed as George Lucas screaming to a crowd. These are my movies. Yeah. <laughs> Such a good Parod parodied version of that. And by the way, by the that. way, George, um, uh, a guy I know that works for Lucasfilm, uh, Ben Bird, about a year ago, he told me that oh. George had seen it. Um, his son, his George's son, Jet, Jet, Jet Lucas, yep, showed his dad. Um, <laughs> so funny. Showed his dad some of the deep fake stuff that I had done for Collider, <laughs> and he said that he just loved it. You know, oh, I love hearing that because I was basically saying, I was basically saying things that George probably uh, thinks. Yeah, well, Mark oh, Hamill. He would love Mark to Hamill say. had tweeted to me too. Mark Hamill had tweeted and said, "That is like the best George." He's like, uh, "I can't speak on the material. I can't speak on what you're saying, but I can tell you that the impression is very good." <laughs> Which wink, is such wink. an awesome Mark Hamill thing to yeah. say. Like, wink wink yeah i exactly. agree with what you're saying exactly um well, I, okay so and i you know i had read that ben burt you you mixed it at skywalker which is which yeah is that really was cool. amazing i had a, my my direct my friend kamel alloway who was the director had a buddy that was a you know sound editor um at skywalker sound <laughs> yeah and uh kamel said uh, hey would you be would would you would you be interested in having the audio mixed? Uh, yeah, I think so. Yeah. yeah, as your mind is falling out of your ear. Yeah, yeah. So I, I think so we okay. stayed there. They have these like cottages yep. that when you're up there, you stay at. So I was there for two nights, and I lost, I lost my mind, man. Yeah. I, mean, I, I mean, so yeah, I mean, George Lucas is probably the filmmaker that I admire the most. He's certainly almost right at the very top. And, um, you know, to be there, uh, at the, at the ranch to see the, the house where he sat and yeah. wrote these movies longhand on yellow legal pad, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, and, but then to have been Rick, Bert, where's Rick, <laughs> yeah, Rick McCallum yeah. walking around. <laughs> we have this, yeah, this is Rick McCallum. And, uh, we had this this great character called the Yasm, and we just wanted to animate him. So we have this new dance number uh, where the band is playing, but now the Yasm sings a song. All right, Rick, that's enough now. Well, I just thought it would be really fun. It was just a stupid puppet that did nothing. All right, George, you don't have to insult the guy. Well, it was just this dumb puppet that just kind of went like that. Right, but I mean, there's a guy under there yeah, well, the hell with that. So now we make the lips go like this, whoa, like that, you know. Okay. Make sure his tongue, make sure his tongue shakes and you can see the vocal cords in the back. <laughs> yeah, let's, yeah, there's like, uh, yeah, there's like uh, saliva dripping yeah. off the teeth. That's George, by the way, I mean, that's pure George Lucas. Like I was watching the Mandalorian, uh, with the episode, everybody was talking about this episode with, 
Lizzo and uh, Jack Black. Yeah. So I was watching it. Uh, I mean, look, I, I, I guess I have to keep my opinions to myself about Mandalorian or else I get canceled. I don't know what happens. I don't know how this works anymore. <laughs> I don't have a blue check mark anymore, so I'm not allowed to say. It. No, it's fine. It's fine. That's my opinion. It's sure. fine. But that that whatever world they were on with Lizzo and Jack Black yeah, and magistrates you know, of Doc the, Brown. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I was like. George, that was my favorite part. Seeing Dr. George Brown. Lucas would love like this is pure George Lucas. There are like yep. these crazy creatures in the background that they never focused. You just saw these crazy tall things walking. Yep. Well, George is probably like, oh, that's, that's good. I like this. <laughs> this is really good. You know, and I remember I do remember. Um, sorry, folks, we're going to talk about Star Wars for a second. I do yeah. remember in that episode they were playing some weird game where like these sentient slime ball things would jump through hoops yeah but i remember reading that uh one of the novels there was a series of lando calrissian novels it was a yep. trilogy yep and that was that was the exact game that lando was betting on i remember he was sitting in the stands betting on and they were they, the writer was describing it it might have been kevin j anderson who wrote it I, I couldn't wrap my head around what the hell he was talking about. But then when I saw it, I went, oh, that's that's what it was. I love that. So I love that they're folks. doing that. I know Star Wars. Oh, Filoni, and, Filoni and, and Favreau are playing in the toy box and they're picking and choosing things, whether they're uh, in canon or not. They're taking things that weren't canon and making yeah. them canon. And they're doing, I think they're doing right by the Star Wars fans, especially with moments like that, like what you're talking about. There's no, yeah. there's always a campiness to Star Wars. Go back yeah, to oh. 77, the original, the mouse droid is campy, you know, yeah. and, 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 and many, many others, the Dianoga putting its head up and doing its little periscope all thing and going it, down. All of it. That's can Absolutely. And, and yeah, I would think it, that, would it help, would it help if I got out and pushed? <laughs> right. It might. It might. You know, this, um, uh, and also the, the reverence for the prequels. I always get very excited when uh, they go to Coruscant or there's yeah. some kind of, you know, pre, or if, you know, like, when Jimmy Smith shows up in uh, anytime Jimmy Smith shows up, I always yep. it brings warm feelings to my heart to quote Master Yoda. But um, Andor's my favorite. Stuff. Andor is my favorite because of the Mon Mothma. Uh, like like seeing the rise of Mon Mothma is like to me. Yeah, I am spellbound. I'm like a little kid. Like I love Andor a lot. Yeah. And 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 seeing her backstory because of, you know in Jedi. You see this woman clothed in white. You know she is the exact uh, right. antithesis of the of, of Palpatine, but you don't know anything about her. So seeing that in Andor is is I want a whole, sick. but I want she's great. But I want to show about the other guy, the guy with the really bad. The, oh the, yeah, that hair. Yeah, general, yeah, yeah, yeah. General General Nadine or something, or I don't Nadine. know what that guy. I don't know what his name is. That Chris guy needs Nadine. his own. Can we Chris give him Nadine, his own yeah. show? Let's call it. Nadine, is it Nadine? I don't know what his name is. Hey, Nadine, I think it's, Maydeen. I'm not sure. I One like Nadine, but make him a woman. You know, we got to change it to a woman. <laughs> make it Nadine. Just have at it. Look, I will say this though. I prefer the sillier, like I loved the book of Boba Fett, especially the episode. I love the one episode that Robert, Robert Rodriguez just went all out. And the yep. rancor is hanging off of a building, Godzilla. I mean, King Kong, 1933 yep. style. I actually like the idea of people that were uh, rebuilt partially with droid. I parts. love that. Yep. Because that comes from, there's a whole series of uh, the, the Marvel comics from the late 80s. And I don't remember their names, but it was a, it was a, it was a female writing team that had these uh, fascinating wow. characters that were part, they were part droid. There was one, there was like a woman that had a, it was a lightsaber, but it was a whip. And wow. she fought Luke and she was so cool and badass. This is in 1985. Absolutely. The and, old Marvel series was really fantastical. But then, but also, but also they had telekinetic uh, bunny rabbits. So, yes. you, know, <laughs> did. you know, but my point of all this is, if you criticize that stuff, the silly stuff, then you don't, you really don't know Star Wars and you certainly don't know who George Lucas is because yes. George Lucas is a goof. I mean, this guy, you can't, he, you know, it'd be kind of funny is if we had like a, well, like this sort of floppy eared character that, you know, he's kind of sillier and maybe bumps into things. 
Sure, George. How can you get mad at that? Stop getting mad about Jar Jar Binks. It's fine. Anyway. I, uh, I, oh, I could not agree more. And we could do an entire show on this. <laughs> well, um, I'll come back. We'll do the Star Wars show. Okay, good. Oh, awesome. Okay. Uh, that You just said the magic words. I'll come back. That makes me so happy. <laughs> and uh, uh, okay. So, hey, do you know who Ralph Garman is? I do know Ralph Garman. Yeah. Okay. Do you know him personally? Uh, yeah. I mean, we've guy, met a few times because of Family Guy. So something that you two have in common other than Family Guy is your impressions have gotten you to uh, uh, a little bit of mischief and 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 a little bit of, uh, I don't know if it was trouble, but definitely mischief. His Jerry Lewis is incredible one time mm -hmm. calling the uh, the French embassy or, or calling France, calling the palace. I don't know what he was doing. The prime minister uh, actually <laughs> yeah. got through because they love Jerry Lewis so much. Right. You and your Schwarzenegger mm -hmm. has actually caused a little bit of disruption to the point where a news anchor had to apologize uh, because you seemingly uh, perfectly convinced him that Arnold Schwarzenegger had a plan to blow up the moon. Um, yeah. Like, how cool is it that your impressions have actually created these kinds of... Yeah, that was pretty great, man. That was back in a, that was in a time when people had a little more fun. <laughs> yeah. Uh, or so. Oh, I, let me, I will say, most people are not uptight. I think if you are, if you're on Twitter all day, you would be convinced thoroughly. Yeah. You'll become that every everything is gone to complete shit. But then you go outside <laughs> and people are like, "Yeah, we don't care. Nobody cares. No one cares. No one cares. Nobody cares. <laughs> no one cares." I'm take it from me. They go, "Eh." Like when you do stand up, yeah. Everybody, everybody insults each other equally. Nobody cares. Everything's fine. But exactly. um, you know, when we would be doing prank phone calls and things, <laughs> back then was like an art. I mean, the first one was. Oh yeah. When I pranked uh, Fox and Friends on the air as Arnold, <laughs> and I have to thank again that was um, that was Larry Larry Wax. He he was the host uh, of a show, The Regular Guys. It was a radio show out of Atlanta, and um, I think Tim Conway Jr. had sort of made the connection with those guys as well. Wow. And those guys <laughs> had brass balls. I mean, they were you know they were like. Hey, uh, let's just call Fox News and tell them that it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. And somehow, whoever was screening the calls was like, oh, OK, yeah. Yes, I want to talk to them because uh, I'm in town, you know, talking about the education and all that. It was better back then. But, you know, but um, I was on the air for like five minutes or something and they they believed it. So that was that was the call that I think also caught the attention of the Stern show. But then um, the the one you're talking about is on MSNBC, there was a guy yes. named Joe Scarborough. Yes. Who had a show called Scarborough Country or Scarborough C County, Scarborough, it sounds country. Scarborough County sounds like a CBS uh, television series that's been sure. on for like 15 years and you've never seen it, but it's no. still on. Yeah, it's, it's right after Dr. Quinn. It's right after Dr. Quinn. If like if like Richard Crenna was still alive, he would probably be the star of it. <laughs> That's a great poll. You know, you'd be like, oh, what's Crenna doing? Oh, he's still doing Scarborough <laughs> County. Oh, he got nominated for an Emmy in the third season. Really? Oh, how many? <laughs> they've been on for twenty five years now. Wow, I've never seen. It's like Blue Bloods. I, yeah, I've oh, never... exactly. Hi, I'm Tom Selleck. I'm on Blue Bloods. You know, I never saw it. God, he's right. You know, I see his poster every day. I walk into CBS. CBS was also just posters of new shows that sure. I've never seen. Yeah. Anyway, but uh, so Scarborough, I called. He heard the prank that I did on the Howard Stern show. So the bit that I did on Stern was, we're going to blow up the moon. We have to get rid of the moon. The moon is useless, you know. But the thing I said was, the, the moon regulates the menstrual cycle of the women. If we get rid of this moon, no more PMS, no more bitching and whining. That's what I said. So, which is a great, you know. So, he, this guy was livid. Like, way to lose half your, uh, your voter base, Arnold. And then he had to come back the next day on air and apologize that the information they were given was erroneous. But but here's the thing, and this is my entire career in a nutshell. This this is what I got tired of. I wish that in that moment, 
Yeah. The very that was a David Letterman. Yeah. Candidate. Oh yeah. And now, now, uh, uh, I wish <laughs> that they had said my freaking name. Yes. Can you just say who the guy is that yeah. did the? Yeah. You know, that was the only thing about all of these things that I've done. Mostly the Schwarzenegger, though, was, you know, you just never knew who it was. They just, they had I've heard policy. you say this, I've heard you say this, this sentiment, uh, express this sentiment a few times on a, a few different uh, outlets. One of the reasons that I'm not just going to, hey, so did you ever meet Peter LaSalle? I'm not going to that right now <laughs> because I know that that sentiment exists. And if we can do something to kind of get that out there and go, okay, like, okay, Jeffrey Peterson was genius. He was awesome. His improv is incredible, which we all agree and we all know. Uh, there is going to be t-shirts available. We want to make sure that we all get that out there. Okay, but I would really like to get out there. Again, that's why we talk about the special. That's why we talk about the, the Arnold prank, some of these things. Because you have, in the shadows, done some really awesome things that you shouldn't be in the shadows. There should be a spotlight showing mm. that that you did this stuff. And, you know, I would say the same thing about Ralph Garman. Like, like when, when he got yeah. let go from K-Rock, I'm like, oh my God, like he's done so many cool things. And, and and I'm glad you know he's kind of attached himself to Kevin Smith and they're doing some cool stuff and he's got a yeah. I would That's I want to get you that warehouse man because I want to see what you'd create out of it like like yeah. you've got this amazing creative mind and and this is the stuff that I wanted to unearth today a little bit um, for our viewers let's go Arnold Schwarzenegger kind of got that attention Stern um, at that point they were doing Evil David Letterman we'll we'll we'll, we'll yeah. talk about that stuff later on but yeah. You know, you get this attention, you move over, 07, you show up. Uh, I believe your first appearance on Late Late Show was in an Arnold bodysuit or something, or at least what was one yeah. of your first ones. And well, then at the that point- The first one, yeah, the first one was yeah. a phone call. It was voice only. Okay, yeah. And uh, I remember that one because I was doing it from the booth that Shadow Stevens uh, would do his voiceover. You know, the Late Late Show brought to you by Anison, brought to you by Bisquick. And- um, <laughs> So they were like, okay, it's going to be fine. Uh, just read the script. Don't deviate from the script. And, um, and of course, the first thing I did was I deviated from the script. And, yeah, uh, flex your muscles. Like, yeah. And yep. Craig was like, well, who's, what's this guy doing, man? What is this? You know, like, don't deviate from the script. Don't, let, don't look him in the eyes. When he comes walking down the hall, don't stare at him. Don't, you know, I did all those. I did everything. I, I had looked at him. I addressed him. It was all the wrong things. And um, yeah, so then I think it was about a month after that. Uh, Joe Strazulo, who's the guy that wrote mostly all of those Schwarzenegger sketches and the guy that saw me doing my preacher character on public access, he uh, he said, uh, what do you think about putting on a suit? Like, do you, do you have any objections to doing the muscle suit and putting on like some? I said, great, I'll do it. Yeah, let's go for it. So, yeah, it was like a two hour makeup. Every time I go in there, they would put these appliances on me. Uh, this guy, uh, Trent, Trent Cotner, was a really great guy, very sweet guy, great makeup artist. But the funny thing about Trent is uh, halfway through him uh, in the middle of applying my makeup, he says, you know, I can't tell if the I'm colorblind. So I don't know. It's like, oh, my God, <laughs> what? because <laughs> I don't I'm not sure. Uh, I think that's eh, probably fine. I mean, he was messing with me, but. But it was it was amazing. And and so that's how that's how and that's I'm glad you brought it up because that is I was doing the Late Late Show. So 2007. Yeah. Uh, and then it just, you know, it was only it was once every couple of months, yep. three months would go by. Hey, let's do another Arnold. Yep. Then that became more frequent. And then I did a couple De Niro's. Uh, and then I started doing bits where I was sitting across from Craig like. He was Larry King and I was Arnold or he was the <laughs> queen and yeah. I was De Niro. That's a really old one. I don't even know if that's out there anymore. Or or he was Pacino and I was De Niro. And we were doing a scene from like uh, our movie. And, you know, I we would just make each other laugh. I mean, I, I would make him laugh before we'd go out. Of, but I was so nervous. I was so intimidated and yep. so nervous. He's a, he's a very, he's a tall guy. Yep. And I'm like this dude that was working at Blockbuster Video. And now all of a sudden I'm here. And it's like one thing to be doing shows in Chino by yourself for an audience of five farmers. And now you're, <laughs> or one prisoner. And you're, and now, you know, I'm like, oh my God. But, um, you know, it, it was an incredible experience. I think it helped that the first 
studio we were in or where I started was the very, a very small studio. Yeah. The original studio, I think where uh, Kilborn had been. Yep. And there was a, I mean, a very, you would talk about public access vibes. That was it. I mean, which is great. The original yeah, that, late night, by the way, had the same vibe. Yeah. You know, you know, they, they, yes. they, and don't get me wrong. I loved, I, again, you talk about these Ferguson purists. Yeah. Oh, I liked it before they got the new studio. Oh, I liked it before they, you know, people who talk about that. Screw that. It yeah. was so the progression was what was awesome, but I don't think the new studio would have been as awesome if it didn't start in the old studio. Like the yeah, progression was necessary. I and remember that. I remember when Letterman went to, well, I remember when Letterman went to CBS. I mean, Absolutely. that was a, I remember that that was very strange, even to yep. me. And I was, uh, you know, 18, 17, 18 years old. Yep. What is, what is, that seems, this doesn't seem right. Like who cares yeah. what network you're on, but it just felt like, you know, NBC and Letterman, it was just ingrained. It was, yep. there was no separating the two. I mean, he's not yep. going to make fun of the, what was it? Was that the, was that the Tiffany network or was it CBS? He CBS is CBS. the Tiffany network. The uh, Tiffany network uh, NBC yeah. was owned by G -E, G GE. And that's where right. he scored all the points on. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, but I, but I, I remember watching his, the first version of that show when I was a kid and yeah, marveling at the audience cam and all these, but I didn't realize that all of that had come from, um, uh, was inspired by, you know, Steve Allen. I mean, Steve yeah. Allen was really the guy that was jumping into giant teacups and doing all these big sort of stunts on his version of The Tonight yes. Show. And um, so, but Johnny, but it's Steve course, Allen, it's Steve Allen in the cable. See, with Steve Allen, it was still big and showbiz and all that's that. That's right. But imagine the Steve Allen antics in the in exactly. the uh, cable access exactly. environment, right? And and yeah, and Letterman had that. That yeah. Letterman's, which is what we embraced as well. I mean, obviously, hundred percent to tie it in for you folks that are upset that we haven't mentioned uh, Worldwide Pants yet. Worldwide Pants produced the late late show with craig Ferguson. there we've done it we found there we go we're there what okay was that as a performer um as you know the crew people like that would they have known that this show was different than any other late night show uh on at the time because you know dave moves over to cbs part of what he got was basically the carson deal extended he got he basically, Johnny Carson worked 30 years to get this amazing, uh, you know, contract that's where right. he owned 1230. And that's where Late Night with David Letterman came from or part of 1230. Letterman moves over to CBS and they're like, well, if you can build us a franchise, you can also have the 1230 and have ownership of that. Unique will probably never be seen again in entertainment in this sort of fashion where, where Worldwide Pants owns two hours of network TV mm -hmm. every single night. Mm -hmm. um, you as a performer, your vantage point did you see that at all? Or as far as you're concerned is you could have been working for CBS or worldwide pants. It made no difference whatsoever in your day-to-day -day stuff. Yeah. I don't think, I mean, I think, I think we, you know, I don't, yeah, I wasn't really privy to any of those sort of goings on with, with, with that, that aspect of the, of the business, but yep. cause I would, you know, but toward the end, I would roll in about an hour. If that before showtime and yep. just, turn on the robot and let's go, you know? <laughs> uh, and I think Craig probably did the same thing as well. All right. Yeah. Let's go. Yeah. A little bit of makeup. All right, let's go. Here we go. You know, but, but it was think, so good because it was so loose. Yeah. Like that's the thing that was so different about you guys is how loose yeah. it was. Craig shows up and he starts tearing up the blue yeah. card. The moment the guest comes out there and you guys could riff back and forth, you could yeah. get involved with the guest. It well, was, there was so that feeling good. That the the, the joke, I mean, the joke was that, that, you know, no one really cared about us, but also that was kind of true. Like we were sort of left alone to yeah. play in the sandbox. And, um, and that's pants in my opinion, that's pants doing that. Yeah. If, if you have a bunch of network CBS network executives around picking everything apart, right. It feels that way many times, I think in the, in the final product, I think maybe, I don't know, like if CBS had produced our show outright, would there have been more money to do things. Ah, there you go. Yeah. It's possible cuz uh I just went to a taping of um you know one of James Corden's final shows. Yeah. By the way, he's a lovely guy. It's so funny how uh I mean I've met him twice. He yep. came to the late late show before Craig's version of the show ended and it was yep. it was very nice. And then I saw him again uh at this taping 
Really amazing to be back at CBS. I had not been back there on the lot since our show ended. Yeah. And I and I got a parking spot for the first time. Wow, they actually had my name on a, can you imagine <laughs> that? Uh, that's a true story. I'll put that in my book, how I think only the last six months of my time on The Late Late Show did I have a parking space. They stenciled my name on one of those concrete blocks but almost every time that I would show up, somebody else would be parked there. So, you know, folks, if you have any illusions <laughs> about showbiz, no, but I, but it was a great experience. The show was very funny. My <laughs> friend, Tim Mancinelli yep. has directed all, all, all versions of the Late Late Show. He's been a part of in some way. Since Snyder? Uh, yeah, uh, after Snyder. Kilborn. So, so Kilborn. Kilborn. Okay, I'm going to ask for, okay, you know that I'm going to ask if there's anybody, that's a guy that I would love to talk to. Yeah, you should uh, talk to him. Boy, the incarnations that he has seen, because yeah. he went, he actually transitioned from pants to CBS. I would love to, okay, anyway. Yeah, yeah but he was, but so he, he was think they got you in this last week, right? He was, yeah, he got me, he, you know, I said, uh, you know, I want to come see the show, buddy, and support you guys. And it was wonderful. It gave me the full tour. I went there with my girlfriend and I was like, you know, honey, over here is where I stood as uh, Jeff Peterson. And uh, here's my and nook where the horse was. Yeah, this is where I was. And that's where Jeff was. And there's the fireplace over there. And um, but yeah, no, Tim um, was uh, I think he was like an assistant director and then became the official director full time during our run and wow. then directed. I mean, he won a bunch of Emmys for the Late Late Show with James Corden. I mean, you know, it's funny, like not a, a number of late late show fans uh speak very ill of James Corden. I get that oh, you guys were sad no. that the show ended. Sure. But like I have never responded or participated to those kind of comments. No. Um I mean it's just the way things go, you know. I I I could have done the show for 3 4 more years. I think I felt like we were just hitting our stride. Yes. But, um you know it also wasn't my name underneath the late, late show title. And you do a show for that long, you know, yeah. you get burned out. It's enough already. So, um, yeah. So, but, but, you know, then it's, it's, I mean, Snyder and then it was Kilborn and it just goes on and on, you know, mm -hmm. now it's over. Now there's no more late, late show, but, uh, it was a great experience. It was great <laughs> to be there and I really enjoyed it. I got to ask, um, you know, your friends with Craig, you know, this announcement of the idea of a syndicated Craig Ferguson entry into the back into the talk show yeah. world again. Are you allowed to talk about any of that? Are you involved in it at all? Are you other than just cheering him uh, on? You know, um, I, I there... honestly, I don't know too much about it. Okay. Um, so we'll see. I, I know. I just know. I will tell you that we we did something like this. Right when the Late Late Show ended, I we did. We did shoot a pilot of some sort that uh had jeff and the horse and um but i think that maybe i don't know i feel like the the 90s kind of tv sensibility has returned there's some kind of a a hunger for that kind of variety show style yep. thing whereas there wasn't at that time so we'll see i don't know all i know is um that he and his team were shopping something around. Yeah. I was not a part of that pilot, um, but he and I have talked about stuff. So okay. that's all I can tell you. I, yeah, I, I appreciate you expertly negotiating the minefield on that. Um, but that, but uh, because... I really, that is all, I don't really know too much to be honest with you, you know? Okay. And so that's the other thing. The other thing is Craig, it, he is who he is and I am who I am. You know, that yes. folks, I just, I love you people out there, but I just want you to know, we're different people. We have our own, we go off and do our own things. You know, we're not. Uh... I think people know that intrinsically. Like when you say it like that, I think yeah. people are okay. Oh yeah. But you guys made such a yeah, that's good true. team together. Like, like again, like Mike and I, you know, seeing when we came and saw you guys, it was the perfect one, two punch. Yeah. You complimented each other perfectly on the show. You complimented each other perfectly and people hunger for that. We talked about nostalgia at Absolutely. the beginning of this episode. There's no question that there's a nostalgia there to see if what you two would do together, um, you know, and, and, and I mean, I don't know what direction he wants to go in, but when you read what was in the trades, it's like, oh mm. man, it would be really cool to see some sort of incarnation that gives a nod to the past. Uh, I've got two more kind of questions here sure. about that. Um, now, 
the pants of it all. Uh, uh, you know, I know that I want to talk about the t-shirts and all that kind of stuff here because, you know, you got a couple of people who are going to purchase them right here. Uh, but, and I want everyone to know about this stuff. Uh, but when it comes to the rights of you, Jeffrey, notice I haven't asked you to say balls once. I don't know if you're allowed to say balls anymore, <laughs> if it's stricken from your vocabulary right, or not. Um, are you, does pants own that property and are you allowed to uh, play in that swimming pool at all? Um, or, you know, like, are you allowed to be Jeffrey Peterson if you want to be? Yeah, it's tricky. Uh, I'm not sure. I, that, that is one okay. of the things I talked with Craig about um, a little while ago when I did a, a T-shirt fundraiser. Yeah. Um, my my best buddy at the time was uh, fighting cancer, my buddy Matt Lodi. And um, uh, so we had a fundraiser and I thought, well, let's, you know, I go, hey, man, let's, you know, let's let's do something with Jeff. You know, I, it's for charity. So that so I got the thumbs up on that because it was for charity. And that would have been that thumbs up would have come from the high up in the up in the high reaches of yeah, the I, power I mean, of worldwide pants. I think I think, yes, it was okay. Craig and and you know, the feeling was it's fine because it, it's because it's for this thing. Gotcha. But if it's but if it's for your own personal profit, um, we have to kind of sort it out. out. It's weird, though, because. You know, it's it's a bummer because there's so many people that have made their own Jeff shirts. Yes. And I, I always I see people wearing them and I go, no, that's not the one, you know, it'll be like, yeah, like some I don't know, some guy in a big band recently was wearing this ass mode shirt and everyone's like look dude cool and i was like no <laughs> man that's not one of ours no but you know but it's but it's so it's i don't really understand how that works because i, I don't know like if it's i if i did it i'd probably get in trouble but we're working it out my point is we're working yeah, it out yeah. but yes worldwide pants i don't think that they really care. I don't think anybody's going to lose any sleep over it until I make like, you know, a hundred thousand dollars. It's like, Hey, let's renegotiate this. Going, now, um, wait a second. Now, hold on. But, um, that would yeah, be a good but, problem to have though. If that were, if that were to happen, that would be a really good problem to have. Cause it would mean like we're living in this time of nostalgic resurgence in yes. so many different ways. Uh, I, I personally, now you do have a signing of some sort coming up, right? I do. Yeah. Um, do we have a date on it yet or is it, is it still something that you're working be, on? It's going to be June 9th. Okay. Um, that's June 9th, 2023, depending on when you're <laughs> watching or listening to this. So it may have already had, it's over folks. Um, but this it will is, be out before then, for sure. It is through an organization called Streamily. <laughs> these these names, man, they're, they're good people, but all these names. Sure. Sifu, Sisu, Streamily, Stramblam. I don't know. It's Streamily. <laughs> anyway, so they do they do signings. They do virtual uh, signings of things. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to have they're they're putting together my store right now. Um, so if you follow me on Twitter or Facebook, you know, just look at Twitter's Josh R. Thompson. If you just follow me on Twitter or Instagram, you will definitely know ahead of time uh, okay. the, the the exact time for this, but it will be June 9th and I will be signing um, a lot of stuff. I, there's gonna be a lot of Jeff Peterson, um, rare yeah. photographs and behind the scenes things. And sign photographs, like one that we could pop right on that yeah. wall there. We can, we'll make yeah, that so happen. What, what, basically, you would purchase whatever you want. Yep. And then uh, during the live broadcast uh, in their studio or here, uh, I will hold it up. I'll say who it's for. And then you can also tell me, you know, what to write on there. And I'll be doing a Q&A as well. I'll be doing a Q&A and answering some of the like most popular burning questions about Jeff Peterson and the Late Late Show. How did it work? How did it come to be? We'll talk about Grant Imahara. We'll talk about all kinds mm -hmm. of stuff. But I thought it would be a good way to take care of both things. And um, it will. So, and I think the charity, some of the portions of the, the proceeds will go to a charity. I haven't figured out which one yet. I'm leaning toward the Starlight uh, Children's Foundation but it may also be something for, um, you know, autism because I'm, I'm starting to do work with, you know, uh, autistic uh, children, which is mm -hmm. stuff that I also really love. And so, but yeah, but I, I want to say thanks to everybody that did help out with the fundraiser for my friend, Matt Lodi, you know, um, uh, he was a great, 
great guy. I, I knew him. For, he was a great, he was such a great guy. He was a very <laughs> great guy. He was a wonder. He was the best guy. There's no better guy than him. Uh, but he didn't make it. He didn't make it. Oh, please, Trump. Well, he's he's, he's gone. He, he couldn't do it. He um, he, he loves, loves you for that right now. I swear yeah, to God. I Energetically, I just feel the need to There's tell no you that question. he loves you for that right now. He, uh, oh, he was a legend. He really was. He was. Uh, it's very strange still to speak of him in the past tense. I will tell you that. Um, but I grew up with him. He was my best buddy all through junior high, high school, forever and ever. And, uh, but thanks to everyone who helped with that fundraiser because it really helped them out a lot. Um, he was a big, um, speaking of Cleveland and local TV and radio, he was um, a sports reporter in Cleveland um, who famously was a huge Pittsburgh Steelers fan. So yeah. God bless you, buddy. <laughs> oh, I'm glad you got a chance to say that here. Um, I get it. I'm, I don't know if we're finishing on this or not. Uh, I guess it depends on your answer, I guess. But uh, yeah. <laughs> Peter LaSalle, um, legendary. Yeah. Late night producer. Carson uh, ended up being picked up by Letterman and mentored by Letterman and all of that stuff. Um, LaSalle, when, when, uh, Mr. Kilborn, uh, was going to be moving on the idea of replacing him, Mr. LaSalle essentially heading up that committee, uh, you know, doing the, the, um, uh, the tryout for four or five different people, Craig Ferguson mm -hmm. ends up doing it. And then LaSalle, you know, the, the, the story is takes Craig under his wing in so many ways. And it's such a part of that show. Um, did you have any interactions with Peter that uh, oh, are kind of sure notable? I did. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Kind yeah. man. Loved his wife, Alice, very, very much. And I just yes. think of Peter right now. Um, yeah. You know, he's, he'd be a dream guest for this program if we could make that ever happen. But I don't think it's going to. And so uh, I, I love talking to people who worked with Peter. Um, as I say oh, that, Peter what pops great. into your head, Josh? Yeah, he was. Well, Peter was a direct link to to Johnny. Right. Yeah. I mean, so. I had um, occasionally I would go up to Peter's office and and hang out and, you know, talk about Johnny and the Tonight Show. I, I like to hear his stories about that show. And, um, you know, it's, it's still very surreal to sit across from a guy that was really there and yeah. really did ha speak with and know Johnny Carson and Ed McMahon uh, and Doc and everybody over there. So. Um, but I had um, gotten a, a, a record in the 70s. In the late 70s, there was a record put out that was The Tonight Show with Johnny Carson. And as this double album, a very curious mix of bits from the show, but audio only, which is very weird. Um, but the so, getting into the comedy the comedy record craze, if yes. The Tonight Show could take part. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and so I had Peter um, autograph that for me. And he, you know, oh. he'd written something like, you know, well, you really know the good stuff, uh, Peter, you know, something, you know, because he was like, he was like, I don't even know what this album is. I don't even know. I don't even know if uh, they were given authorization to make this. And I was like, Peter, I, I mean, it's 1978. I don't Well, maybe, maybe we could look into this. And no, no, no. <laughs> started a lawsuit here. But Peter was, you know, oh, Bushkin. Was old school, legendary. Yeah. To be revered. Um, I had nothing but respect for him. Uh, and, and two things I remember, sometimes I would get called in. <laughs> I would see, I was in a very unusual position as the <laughs> disembodied voice of this character. Uh -huh. Because what made Jeff Peterson work to some degree, and by work, I mean the fact that it stuck around as long as it did, was that I physically was not out there on camera. The idea that it was a robot sidekick, I yep. think made everything go down a little bit easier. It was a little more palatable for everybody. <laughs> you know, because you could slip some things in, no pun intended. That, well, that, uh, but also like sharing the stage really with another person is, you know, it's a tricky thing, especially yeah. if it's your show and suddenly there's this other guy. Yep. Who's this guy? And also, I mean, again, all credit to Craig for saying, well, let's give it a try and see what happens, you know. And I remember he said, Jess, you know, take it easy. Like, don't. And I was like, don't worry, man. I'm not going to, you know, just don't 
I guess wait until I look at you. Well, then it was like, well, I don't know when you're looking at me because left is right and right is left. Like when he, when I'm looking at my monitor backstage and sometimes he doesn't say, Jeff, what do you think? He'll say, what do you think? And I would go, oh shit, he's talking to me. <laughs> so then we had to cut a hole in the side of the audience wall where I stood so that I could physically see what Craig was doing. So once we figured all that out, somehow it worked, but it could have gone really badly. It could have yeah. like been a could disaster. have been cut in the first week. I mean, because Craig got bored with things very quickly. Yep. I thought it was going to last really, truly like a couple of weeks and that would be it. Oh, that was fun. Take care. Yeah. Um, but what would happen occasionally is I would get a hand slap from the producers or the censors because like if Craig said vagina, Josh, you can't say vagina again. So it was like, okay, so th so you have to understand that when I was doing the show, almost every night, <laughs> Michael Natus, the producer, would walk past me and go, okay, Josh, uh, the audience is very tired. Uh, Craig is in a bad mood, so it's all up to you. Have a good show. And then he walked away. <laughs> and I go, <laughs> you know, so, so you have to understand, like, Break a leg, buddy. Yeah, it's like, and don't say this and make sure that you're not like, Jesus. he's going to say nasty things. We want to try to steer him away from, oh, you you want me to try to steer him away? <laughs> so what happened was um, one time I got in a little trouble. I don't remember what for. So silly. Thinking about it now is yeah. so, so silly. Yeah. We have editors. It's not live. I know it's a shock, but. So <laughs> hey, Peter, Peter and Michael want to talk to you. Oh yeah. God. Uh, you, they want you to go up to Michael. They want you to go up to Peter's office. Oh, oh boy. boy. So what, what I love about this moment is this is the most old school Hollywood moment you could ever, this is what happened. Hey, come up. So Peter's sitting at his desk with all these, you know, Emmys and awards and photographs behind him. And he's got <laughs> his sweater on with his collared shirt underneath. Come on in. How are you? Have a have a seat. Come on in. And then following close behind me is Michael Natus. He suddenly appears out of somewhere, a trap door. I don't know. I'm like, whoa, wow. Well, and, and he comes in, he follows me in, and we and we sit down in front of you know this throne. And then all of a sudden, Peter reaches down under his desk and presses a button and it makes the door close. Makes the door close to the office. That is old school Hollywood. Oh my it, god! Because these guys, they they all had this. This was a thing. Oh, it wasn't. It was just a thing that you had. It was this power thing, and it was the most. Now that I, I mean, it's the coolest thing ever. Sure, but but in that moment, I was terrified. <laughs> so the door closes, and it's like, hey, uh, hold all calls for about five minutes. <laughs> I'm like, am I going to get beaten? Is he going to pull a belt out? Like, what's going to happen here? And I mean, in, in the serious tone, the most serious tone, uh, he says, now, you know, we've talked to you a couple of times. Uh, first of all, I think you're doing a great job. Oh, boy. You're wonderful. And I go, well, this is not. This, yeah, this is, is a shit sandwich anything. coming. Okay, yeah. <laughs> but we, well, Michael, maybe you can take it, you know? And then now, now they're, now we're going to do a little back and forth and whatever it was, it was like, well, we just feel that, you know, if Craig says these words that you can't say those words, okay, sure thing. No problem. You got it. Yes, sir. Can I get out? Is the door open? Can I get out of here, please? <laughs> no. You're freaking so, me out. Yeah. So, but, um, but it's important to understand that, that I, not only, I was back there making stuff up, but then all of a sudden there was this, thing in the back of my head now where I was holding I was holding back and there are some shows where you can see Craig look over at Jeff but really he's looking at me yeah and he'd be like what what's go what the hell's going on man you all right man I'm fine man everything's fine and anytime that like Jeff would be surly or pissed off it was probably because I was really pissed off he's like what are you doing man you seem like you're not yourself man no it's just I don't know man I'm having trouble at home and i don't know it's well what, what are you talking about someone got to you didn't they man no it's fine man so eventually i went to craig's office. i just i directly went to his office and i knocked on the door 
which everyone told me not to do. They're like, don't, no, he's, don't disturb Craig. He's in his, you know, meditation chamber, whatever the hell he's like, his door's open. He's fine. Mr. Ferguson. Of solitude. Yeah. Now I need to talk to you for a minute. I got these fellas over here pushing me around and I don't care for it. And uh, he's like, yeah, don't, don't listen to them, man. Listen, just do what you do, man. Don't worry about it. And I'll tell you, that was the greatest thing he could have said because the last year of that show, anybody who watched that show, yeah. um, boy, oh boy, it's not like I wanted to say anything that was offensive. It's no. not like we were trying. It's just that you gotta, you gotta give me a little room yeah. to play. Because if he's throwing me a softball, I, I have to I have to swing for it. You Definitely. can't I can't like keep going, oh, I don't know if I because it's only gonna make him unhappy. So so there was <laughs> there was some of that stuff going on, which I respected because I wanted to be a team player. And I have nothing but respect for all of the people, all the producers, especially LaSalle. I mean, I'm not yeah. gonna but at the same time, I think there was a little push and pull of old school, new school. But I also think LaSalle was very important because he was the key to a lot of those great guests that we got from that golden era. Oh, time, yeah. You know, without a so, doubt. But that's what that's what was kind of going on back there, man. And, you know, puppeteering this robot, which a lot of people surprisingly still weren't aware that, like, I physically. <laughs> yep moved jeff the voice the mouth was not voice activated there was a switch that i had to press every time that jeff talked so i just sort of got used to doing that and didn't really think about it and it made the mouth do that and the head swivel and the eyes blink and of course grant imahara the late great genius grant imahara is the guy who built jeff and mm -hmm. showed me how to operate it and um so that was happening and then i took over doing the rhino head and then I'm doing all these musical instruments, you know? So yes, I think, I think then when somebody comes in and goes, right. But if you, if you could just not, you know, look, man, I mean, to their credit, they never made me wear a headset. Uh, there was talk of giving me an earpiece. Oh so that no. The producers could tell yeah. me. No. I said, no, no, no way. No. Yeah. The organic stuff was the gold and the tension that you're talking about here was the mining of that gold. In my yeah, opinion, the tension's not a bad thing. Like it's, it's it, the push pull is actually what stretches and that gets you and Craig to have these conversations that you're talking about here to me. That's a good yeah. thing. But the, 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 the earpiece being produced, I, I, to me, that's just not. No, no, no. My, you know? Yeah. No, no, Craig, no, no. Craig put a stop to that. And I, I, that's one of the things I went to him immediately with. And I go, look, dude, I, I am not going to sit there and have five people, no, telling me what to do. No. Um, and maybe there was, listen, maybe there was some method to the madness. Maybe, you know, LaSalle, listen, he's, he's a legend. So maybe he, you know, I wouldn't, I, I wouldn't be surprised if he knew that that was what was going to happen. Like, yeah. well, let's, let's see if we can, because Craig, you know, we talked recently and he was like, you know, we used to derive glee. <laughs> it's very mean, but he said, sometimes, you know, if we found out, like, if you were going through, like, a bad breakup, you know, some of the writers told me that you were going through a bad breakup, and I knew that. And so I knew that you were going to be really funny that week, man, because yeah. like, Jeff was really bitter and angry. And so he would just, he would poke. Yep. And that's when we would have the, oh, shut up, man. You know, oh, you know, kiss my ass. You know, a lot <laughs> of that stuff was, was shit that was really happening in my yeah. life. And that's when Jeff became interesting because in the beginning it was pre-recorded phrases, which were great. Tom Straw and Bob Oshak were the guys who wrote a lot of those, you know, in your pants and bulls. And you know, mm -hmm. there I said it. There it is. I got it. Balls. Thank you. Uh, you know, the lawyers sex. are on their way. Yeah. Oh, oh, they're right here. Sorry, guys. I'll be right <laughs> with you. They just you guys are quick. All right, all right. Put the gun down. That's that's a little excessive. That's a little excessive. <laughs> Uh, sex party. That was another one, but, um, yeah, Craig did, sex. Craig did the voice in the beginning. So Craig did the yeah. voice and it sounded like this. Hello, Craig. Ha ha. You're yeah. the man, which was a great bit. It was the idea of your own sidekick. That'll kiss your ass. That I could see him getting tired of, by the way. And he did. There's a good, yeah, yeah there you go. Yeah. Because there you go. 
you know, it was like, I get it. It's like, look, man, I just want to come in and talk to people. I don't want to have to record this shit, man. <laughs> and I'm now I'm talking to myself and I'm like, yeah. So thankfully, you know, again, to his credit, he said, you want to give it, you want to give it a world, man? Just come up with a voice or something, man. Tom Straw, who has since he's gone on to be, he's an incredible novelist. He writes these incredible novels. Uh, Tom Straw um, was the writer at the time who wrote the Jeff phrases. And he was the one that was pushing for this kind of a uh, George Takei. Yep. Oh, oh my. So in the beginning, <laughs> it was very, hello, Craig, how are you? Ooh. It was very like that, but you can only do that for so long before your voice is completely ruined, you know? Hello, <laughs> how are you? Yes. Mm. And I- And George I, is a perfect I, testament to that. No, I'm just kidding. I'm just- It's true. <laughs> oh, how dare you? Ah, ha, 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 yes. I was very, I was not really a fan of that. Yeah. I pushed back on that. My original idea was, well, Jeff is a robot. So in his programming, he would be able to do other voices. No, 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 no one's going to go for that. No one's going to go for that. Okay. But I, <laughs> but I understand now because it was like, let's just slowly introduce yeah. this thing. Evolve it. Yeah. Let's not make this the Josh Robert Thompson show. I get that you're excited. And I wasn't <laughs> trying to do that. It was like, well, I just want to make it funny. Yeah. Yeah. I get it, but let's relax. And then I was trying to pitch. We should do it every night. I should be there live doing it. Well, let's just, we'll see. So for the first year, uh, I would just come in now and again and pre-record phrases that would then be loaded up onto an iPad, which one of the writers would just press a different button and he would say one of my phrases. So I wasn't yeah. I wasn't there. Um, yeah. But then when we decided to do that, I mean, that was it, you know? That was the best uh, idea possible. You're okay for another five minutes? We're okay? Sure, yeah. Or, okay, yeah, okay. The, cat, the so, cat's finally quieted down, so we're okay. Which is put too bad. A kid, an appearance of a kitten down. would... <laughs> Just have a seat. Make some. Make him coffee. Will you? They'll be fine. <laughs> um, the, uh, the desert. Is the car in the desert. Is that the first time? Is that the inaugural... Uh, yeah. bit where you yeah. become became animated and 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 I'm pretty yeah I think that's that's the first one yeah. I remember that was the Vegas uh that was the hangover parody yes it was a hangover parody yes yes yeah. yes 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 okay and I was like oh uh okay we're gonna we're gonna be in this 57 Chevy we're gonna be on a camera truck yeah we're gonna be going down Las Vegas Boulevard uh it's gonna look like Jeff is driving Josh you're gonna lie down in the back seat we're gonna cover you with a blanket and then this little person Brad Lace is gonna be dressed as a leprechaun he's gonna be sitting on you by the way that's a clue to what the rest of your career is gonna be like buddy okay <laughs> so stay behind the seat with the right and lines, that, that is also a David Lynch movie, by the way. It is. Oh, it is. Oh, 100%. I was like, what? <laughs> what is happening here? Hey, Brad, how are you, man? But I remember um, being stuck. We got, you know, Las Vegas Boulevard, notorious traffic. Stop yep. and go, stop and go. So there's Craig Ferguson in a 57 Chevy with Jeff Peterson, and suddenly we're stopped in front of who knows what casino, and all these people start coming over. <laughs> I bet. <laughs> Everyone's in the camera truck. So it just looks like Craig, the robot, and the leprechaun are sitting in a red, right. So A lot of flip phones out. A lot of flip, bad yeah. pictures being taken at that point. And so I have the headset on. I can hear the director, and I can hear Craig. And he goes, uh, all right, get us the fuck out of here, man. All right, <laughs> I don't care how you do it, man. Turn this thing around right <laughs> fucking now, man. So what I, I remember what I did as Jeff Peterson and I, I do, in the moment I was I thought I debated with myself for one second. I said, should I should I do this? Am I going to I'm going to go ahead and do this. So I made Jeff's head swivel to, to Craig and I said something like, oh, does the does the big late night talk show host want to go home? Oh, is this, this is too hard for you? And he just started crying, laughing. And I think I think that may have been it. I think that may have been the moment. Light bulb moment. Bing. Yeah. There it is. If I could hear people go, what is he, what is he doing? What is he doing? You know, 
oh, is it, oh, you don't want to talk to the people. You want to go and have a nap, whatever, whatever it was I was saying. The idea of Jeff that I think appealed to Craig the most is when I, as Jeff, yep. would, uh, would rib Craig and would give him a hard time about, you know, just his position on that show and how it really wasn't that hard. <laughs> and that's, those are the things that I think would make him laugh the most, you know, uh, someone gently not calling him on his shit, but just really, really yeah. calling out the absurdity of this whole thing. Which is what the puppets on set and secretariat and all the things that, yes. that, that is what, that is in my opinion, that is the theme of the show. And that is why it's the direct throwback to the original late night. That's why yeah. I love your show so much. Uh, I, I, yes, that th this is exactly what, you know, it's funny when you, when you, when you talk to somebody and you're like, okay, I'm pretty sure that this is how it is. And then you talk to them and it's like completely different. Yeah. This is one of those ones where it's like, okay, I feel like a mind meld here. I, yeah. I there's so many people that are going to be happy about this. Uh, I'll tell you this, even, um, when we saw you guys live and Craig actually expressed this sentiment a couple other times, I, I can't off the top of my head think of it, but he it definitely expressed it that night in the uh the Kelowna community theater shout out uh mm -hmm. to Kelowna um you know he talked about because you guys had announced the show was ending and and he you know dismissed almost his position in late night history he hated the idea that it was a fraternity the, the you mm -hmm. know that that he's a part of this thing which is kind of the attitude that Dave had originally Dave doesn't like schmoozing around you know the uh, doing the Hollywood thing, the showbiz thing, does not like that, almost yeah. resents it, almost is bitter towards it. By this point, all the late night hosts didn't want the late shift debacle of when we were 18 of what happened. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, you have the Jimmies and all these people are being nice to each other and everybody's happy and all that stuff. Craig went out of his way to say, I am not part of this fraternity. I don't want to be right. a part of this, which I also believe it's along the same lines of what you're talking about. It's another one of those ingredients that made your show so good is that, you know, you were able to make fun of the entire genre, but be entertaining in doing it. Like the puppets yeah. didn't mock it. It made it cooler in my opinion. Right. You, uh, you know, I, I, I'm certain people would ask you, Oh, did you ever, you know, study Paul Schaefer or some of these other sidekicks? Probably not. I, I don't think you be, you, you're that guy. I think you're, you're doing something much cooler that happens to be the same thing. Right. These other people in history have done, but I, I don't know if any it, of that makes sense to you or not. It does. But no, it does. It, yeah. It's absolutely true. And, I, but I also think there, the key for me was there was still a reverence and a knowledge of yes. all those shows that had come before. Um, yes. I mean, There's a respect just, there. Yeah. I have a deep respect even before Johnny um, of uh, Steve Allen and, you know, all, all these other Par and all those guys. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I, I sort of sort of gravitated toward that at a very young age. I didn't understand what it was, but I knew that it was something that I uh that appealed to me. And me too. Um, you know, watching I even remember w when Tim Conway um had his had a show. He had a you know, it's one of the Tim Conway went through this too, because Tim Conway, you know, of course was on Carol Burnett and Friends mm -hmm. and I mean, one of the greatest comedy shows ever on television of that era. And, but then, you know, he, he, he then went to do his own show and I don't know that it did particularly well. I mean, it was on, it was very short lived, but I remember it as a kid because I remember the opening of the show that had his name. It was these giant letters they made Tim Conway. And I, I think he came out of the letter I, like a giant letter I in Tim was a door and he would come out and go, hey, everybody. And it was like, <laughs> and, you know, I think that um, I always had a respect for that. And I'd always jokingly call uh, Jeff Peterson because he's a skeleton, you know, dead, dead McMahon. That was, that was the, that's yeah. who he was, yep. you know, but he was not a yes man. In fact, that was the beauty of Jeff. Yes. And also Ed McMahon. Because Ed was also the kind of person that would, uh, depending on how much he had to drink that evening, would uh, challenge Johnny. And Johnny really liked that. Um, it was very funny. Those those are the moments to me that I loved. So I always yeah. liked that Craig had this robot on his hands that would do anything but kiss his ass. 
and um, you know, just didn't care. I don't know. And somewhere along the line, Jeff was he was a gay robot. I don't. Yep. He was a gay robot skeleton. But then anytime there was like a beautiful, uh, you know, actress that was on, <laughs> I would would be you know flirting with her uh and then he said i thought you were gay man not not today not tonight <laughs> not 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 right now no 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 i think uh but yeah so yeah there there is a reverence but also we're just gonna do what we do the way that yeah. we do it but there was it was never planned there was only one time when uh i would walk with bob oshak writer bob oshak i would walk to craig's dressing room we only did this one time. What Bob would do is sit and run through the monologue. There was a monologue and there were great writers. It was an incredible yep. group of writers. Um, but what started to happen was because Jeff was there, Craig would get like halfway through, you know, page two of the monologue and go, yeah, who cares, man? So what would you do this weekend, Jeff? Yep. Yeah. Love that. You go, well, so I, 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 there was a point where I had to, I don't think they were really mad and I don't think they care. Actually, my friend Joe told me, he's like, we didn't care. We were getting paid no matter what. I don't give a shit if they didn't read our words. <laughs> you know? so, oh, right. But there was a point where I sort of was like, fellas, you know, I apologize. I, I you know, I got, when he says hello to me, I got to say hello back. I don't know. They're like, Oh God, C continue. Fill your boots. Please. Yeah. You know, cause the beauty was there'd be a monologue and uh, you know, you'd get to like page two and then the next day you'd see the pages that he didn't get to. They would, they would now appear in that day's monologue. And then he would do one of those pages. And then the next day you'd see the pages he didn't get to in that monologue. And they just kind of keep it in there for a while. And he played this game where I'm just never going to get to it, man. I'm just never going to get to it. You it's know? passe now. Yeah. It was really fun. So, and we were, yeah, it was just kind of all over the place. I mean, really, the sketches and things that we came up, I mean, the sketches were written, right? So the Schwarzenegger yeah. stuff and Craig did, Craig did a lot of sketches before I came around. Mm -hmm. uh, it was very sketch heavy. Yeah. Um, and musical numbers and things musical like that. Numbers, puppets, puppets yeah. of course. Yeah. Yeah. And then we started coming up with our own like GP and the Fergs. Like, so we, we started like making shit up. <laughs> <laughs> what what would be our what would be our uh you know our police our cop show man oh gp and the fergs yeah and then all of a sudden the next thing you know the props props department has a you know a gun holster right now now we got uh hey can you guys make a logo and a little bit of a music for that yeah and then i and then i'm doing the voiceover going it's gp and the fergs <laughs> and so it was it was the idea of something out of nothing. And um, but just a, just a little bit like not. In other words, like we didn't go overboard and like, OK, let's shoot full episodes of GP and the Fergs. We're going to go. And again, to their credit, yeah. the Late Late Show with James Corden. Embrace that beautifully. I mean, for sure. James Corden's bit where he uh, is training with Tom Cruise to do skydiving and oh, flying yeah. in the jet is so yeah. brilliant. And carpool karaoke was a brilliant conceit. I mean, yep. it's it's incredible. But we, but that's a different show. It, yeah, it's not absolutely. Good or bad. We just, well, the idea that was funny of our show was it was just enough, because I had pitched an idea where we were going to do different eras of our version of the show. So we were going to do like a black and white 1950s show. It's a we great idea. In the seventies, and yep. Craig was like, "That's great, man." <laughs> and we did one time we did one where I appeared on camera. It was supposed to be the very first episode of the late, late show with Craig Ferguson. I love, okay. Thank you for Remember calling this? this back. This is awesome. Yep. Yep. And I'm wearing, I'm actually physically at the lectern yep. with a plaid <laughs> suit coat. And it's just me going, Oh, and, um, Craig says something like uh, something about Steve Gutenberg. And I go, oh, <laughs> Steve Gutenberg is the biggest star in the world. His star will never fade. <laughs> and, uh, and then he says, so what are you doing this weekend, Jeff? Oh, I'm going skydiving. <laughs> skydiving, yes. But it will be very safe or something <laughs> like that. I'm sure nothing will happen. So the other idea was that Jeff had these multiple bullshit stories about how he came to be, how he died. 
Oh, you know, no one way. of them was he skydiving and he plummeted to his death because the parachute didn't work. Yeah. The other one was that he got into a fight with, um, what was it like Burl Ives or something? Something. <laughs> He got into a fight with, it was like Burl Ives or Wil Wilfred Brimley. Somehow he got into a bar fight <laughs> and that's how he died. And and so that but was- But that was never acted by you. That was the only time at the podium there, that bit you're talking about was the only time that you ever was, were you before Jeff, right? That yeah. was, that was a, yeah. I love that moment. Because I, then, I was on camera as Arnold and De Niro and yes. some other characters. Yeah. But that was Jeff. That was Jeff- in the flesh. Yes. And um, so, yeah, I always found it kind of weird. I think, I think it, the only, uh, the, the, when I went through kind of a, a, you know, a dark, a dark, just a, it was a sad time for me because, you know, talking about all these bits and all these things that were going on behind that wall, there was this assumption or feeling that, well, shit, once this show's over, I mean, Hollywood, that Mr. Hollywood, I'm talking about. Yep. Yeah, Mr. Yep. Hollywood's going to present me with the key to the city and go, we know all about your work, son. Welcome aboard. Yep. And the crazy thing is that just never happened. Like there was no, there was little to no knowledge yep. that this guy had been doing all those things back there. And so yes. now, of course, you know, it's fine. I know that I did it. We, as we're talking, you know, it's very yep. clear. It's part of this legacy of this amazing thing. But yeah, I mean, it's a, it was a weird position for me to be in. I think the most unusual and very specific job description that anyone's ever had in late night television is being the robot sidekick because right. the character is so well loved, but the person behind it is not necessarily as well known. I think that's changed, but I've also come to realize that it just, it, it's not that important. I mean, it isn't, it is important for a performer. You would like people to know, you know, and I do think that, I do think that CBS, not CBS, I think they, I think they handled things a little bit differently. I've told the story before about Comic-Con when we had Jeff Peterson there two years in a row mm -hmm. at the CBS booth, which I always jokingly say, you know, the first booth that anybody who's going to Comic-Con races to, <laughs> you know, the, the number one on the list. Hey, you got, you guys want to see what's popping at the CBS booth this year? The Tiffany Network's here. Let's go. My God. Walker, te Texas Ranger, I think. <laughs> but so they had Jeff Peterson there. Um, and I mean... There were hundreds of people the, that lined up to talk to him and take pictures with him. So I was hidden away, puppeteering. I could see people through this camera, and I was talking oh. to everybody. And the weird, and so for for some reason they would not let me come out and talk to everybody. And I very calmly said, "You see, Comic Con is where you meet the people yeah. behind these things." Well, you know, no. next year, next year. So next year came. Same thing. Well, Rob Paulson, the great Rob Paulson, yeah. great voice actor, wonderful yeah. human being. I get a knock on the CBS booth at Comic-Con and I open the door and it's Rob Paulson. And he says, I just had to come over here and say how much I love what you do. And I'm like, oh my God, you know, Pinky and the Brain, Teenage yeah. Mutant Ninja Turtles, you're Rob Paulson, you know, and beyond. And, um, and he goes, Rob Paul's the nicest guy in the world. He goes, why the hell they got you in here? And I, exactly. I was like, thank you, Rob Paulson. So this is not to complain. This is nope. this story. I always tell the story to, to illustrate for you exactly kind of what I was sort of dealing with and why my feelings about it were very mixed when the show ended, because I feel like I did a lot on that show and I had such a good time. And uh, my hope is that someday, maybe soon, uh, we there'll be a documentary or some kind of an inch. Cause I have a lot of, you know, behind the scenes stuff. Um, so I'd love for people to see that. Yeah. And that is some of the things we'll be talking about, you know, during that signing as well, specific questions we'll be answering. And some of the photos that you can purchase will be, you know, of the controller or the props and things like that, because, you know, people are,
people just didn't know. It's not, it's not that they didn't want to know. They just didn't know. It just yes. wasn't, you know, I think, I think if we did the show now or if it was done by CBS or if it was in a different period of time, I think there would be a whole other channel devoted to just, you know, uh, uh, Instagram. It would be like, what's Josh doing today? There'd be a spinoff. There'd be, yeah, absolutely. Or the curtain would the be blown wide like, open. Like absolutely. Kelly Clarkson, the Kelly Clarkson show I've been doing yep. for three seasons now, uh, doing the voice of God for Kelly's yeah. game show segments. <laughs> Amazing crew, <laughs> wonderful people. Kelly is such a sweetheart and she loves this voice of God. And I'm there almost every week. And, um, but they do a lot of, you know, they've embraced social media. But our show was was going off the air right as that stuff yeah. was kind of getting popular. So, well, it's 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 uh, you know, hmm. this is one of those things where I wish they would have just given you the deed to the warehouse yeah. uh, at that point, so you could just be doing what you're doing, and then also have this. There's lore in what you're talking about. Yeah. And 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 that what you're talking about here is actually kind of charming as well. You know, that 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 is the story. Like I appreciate that story. I just want you to be kicking as much ass as you are as a result of that as you could be as yeah. a result of that story. So that's kind of the yin and yin and yang to it for me in my opinion. Yeah. Cuz that that is that is a charming uh part of of late night folklore to me. Um now you mentioned earlier something about a book is that true or is that just something that you were saying yeah i i don't want to say too much because okay. it's one of those things where i think if you start talking about this stuff okay. uh, in too much detail then you end up not doing it okay um so i won't say what it is okay um there are there are two different books that i'm working on right now outstanding um, you know uh one of them probably autobiographical awesome. so there's that uh, and then the other is a story that uh, has I have not been able to get out of my head for the last 20 years. And, um, you know, it, it is horror. It is a it is a you know, it is fiction. Yeah. And um, but I uh, it's something I want to make into a film. I want to make it into a short film. But for me, I'm just going to write it first as a as a story. Awesome. Uh, and I'm really excited about that. And that is the one um, that I want to shoot as a film, probably shoot it back in, in Cleveland. Um, I got the cast in mind. I, I it, it, Nothing would make me happier. Uh, the moment that I'm on set <laughs> shooting that, because I can see it. I can just see it very clearly in my head. And it's very exciting to me. And I get very inspired by um, filmmakers, uh, especially guys like, you know, M. Night, M. Night Shyamalan, who yep. um, there's a guy that just it's such an incredible trajectory, like to watch his journey um, like there and back again. Like but yep. this guy, like rediscovered his love of filmmaking. He went through the whole I mean, I can't speak for him, but he went through the whole Hollywood system, yep. and came, got spit out the other end. Yep. And then just grabbed a you know, DV cam and just shot this amazing horror movie, The Visit. Yep. And it's just been, it's like watching somebody like that. And also now his family's involved, his daughter's a director mm -hmm. and his incredible show, Servant. That's the other thing. And Apple TV uh, Plus, mm -hmm. uh, quietly, Apple TV is like making the, they're just green lighting the craziest shows and I'm so um, I, I'm I admire it so much. It's such an inspiring thing to watch. There's you optimism know? whenever somebody lets somebody be a creative, and yeah. I mean we've seen it so many. We've seen the ebbs and flows of it so many times in our uh, you yes. know pop culture lives, where 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 you know we watched indie music become the thing, indie film, same thing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and you get your Tarantinos and your Kevin Smiths and your Robert Rodriguez's come up and all that. And every once in a while, then it shifts back to okay, we got to make a bunch of money. But then watching sure. the pendulum swing back to the creator side of things yeah, and somebody with money allowing that to happen. God damn, I just want to. It's focus. always been this way, you know, like in the. Give 80s, it to this guy. Let, let Josh Robert Thompson's voice get out there. The, You've I'm got so you, much to say. The 80s, the 80s was. It, it's it's all it's on a cycle. It's the same. Absolutely. Thing. The, the 80s, you know, there were suddenly it was big budget. Yep. Giant adventure films, then the horror movies. And then the 90s, the early 90s was a reaction against that. And then that yep. was the indie movement again. Yep. Now we've got A24, which is essentially 
the Miramax. Yeah. Uh, although in a lot of ways, taking bigger swings and bigger chances. Yes. And our Ari Aster, you know, is a guy like I'm not the biggest Ari Aster fan, but what I love is that a guy like that has been given a platform to make his three hour film, which yes. was a short film that he made. One of his first films was a film called Bo. It's the same story. And now he was able to, which is what I'm trying to do is make the short film and then make this feature film. And, yep. you know, but, but my, I guess what I'm saying is you can have both, you know, you yeah. can, but it's okay if you don't want to do that thing anymore. Like one of my favorite uh, bands uh, is uh, Tangerine Dream. Yeah. And over the years I've collected, I mean, there's hundreds of albums. It started in high school. I have them all. I've got the vinyl. I've got everything. Yeah. And t you want to talk about a band that, you know, every couple of years they would throw out all of their equipment and get new stuff. Then in the 90s, they went through like, using Atari software and it sounded like video game music and people yep. were like the hell with this shit. And then they'd started doing opera stuff. And, but the beauty of Tangerine dream and Edgar Froza, who was the, the front man. I mean, he just was this writer, artist, poet, guy, musician who just did what he did. You just, yes. you, you can't, you can't, you, you can't worry about what everybody's telling you, you know, unless, you know, you're on the set and Disney's paying the bill and they go, look, yes. we need for you to have. And then I go, OK, but, you know, we're tired of it. I'm tired of it. I get it. I understand when I'm watching a Disney Plus show that it's a TV show. But, you know, let's take some chances. Let's yeah. you know, do something interesting, you know, like anyway. And Apple That's, is doing, no, I agree. They're, and they're, Apple's doing that. Apple is. And there are other examples that you, you talked about that are doing that. Um, that's where I hope, I hope you run you know, right into the headlights of one of these, one of these people. Cause you have a lot to say. And again, I, I yeah. go back, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of, you know, move towards the end, the way that we started it. Again, I look at, I look at the Josh Robert Thompson show that you put out that special you put out. And again, I just, the voice that you had then, well, the voice that you've had now is that, but evolved and evolved and evolved. And you've had all this time to yeah. think about this and you've got these projects on the go. I'm so excited about it. I'm so excited that we've connected because I want to be part of the promotion machine for, for whatever right. it is that you put out moving forward. I want to reminisce more. I want to do this. I want to do more of this. Um, I can't thank you enough for doing this today. Um, now, Mike, do you have any questions for, for Josh? No, I was going to, but then when I heard... You got what you, okay. I got what I needed today. Mike is, <laughs> Mike is my best friend and we, um, can I, can I talk a little bit yes. about, oh, okay. So, so, uh, L Lodi. Yeah. Was Matt it? Lodi. Yeah. Matt Lodi. Yeah. Okay. Um, Mike is my best friend. Um, we've been best friends, uh, for a long, long, long time. And there he is right there. Um, <laughs> he's got, he's got the cancer too. He's got the cancer oh. right now. And so we're, it's not bringing it down. This is not about that, but, but we're both living life very presently. Yeah. Um, you know, Kevin Smith comes to Vancouver, Mike and I go down there and we go hang out with him and we hang out with him and Jay for a little while to, you know, say, Hey, at the, at the meet and greet and all that kind of stuff. Cool. Uh, the moment I started talking to you, I knew your name because like I was always the big Letterman guy and Mike was a Letterman guy too, but we would in the, in the mid two thousands got to a place where I'd go over to his house every Friday night. We'd all play poker with a bunch of, you know, married guys with kids and all that. Mm -hmm. so the safe poker game. And Mike started telling me like, I'd watch Ferguson like crazy, but Mike started telling me about you. He started telling me cause he went down the rabbit hole to find out, okay, but what, about, how, how is this happening with Jeff and what, what's going on and all that. <laughs> and, and, and he, told me about what was going on with you. And it, and it was, it was one of those things where, um, you know, and then when, when Craig came to town and we found out you were opening for it, he was more fucking excited that you were opening for Craig than the fact we were going to go see Craig. And so when that it was, was um, don't tell Craig that don't, tell, uh, no. don't tell Craig that, but your, your tweets and emails and how you would just go off and, and, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, your little place there and, and yeah. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Juice, throw some beads. And I mean, I just love that. That was ah, that's great. Thank you, man. So that when means a lot. I didn't tell him like, cause I wasn't sure this was going to happen right away. Like you and I connected and all that. And then uh, last night 
I called him up and I said, Hey, what are you doing tomorrow? And uh, wow. I'm like, you want to come sit in the jumper seat and 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 be part of this? And I just, I just, so from a personal standpoint, yeah. I want to say thank you thank so you. much. But you're, are you good with questions and all that for this go around? Oh, absolutely. All right. And you he's, should he's, get, you he's should okay. give him a higher, you should give him a higher jumper seat though next, next time. time. Next Very... time we're, we're going to expand the set a little bit more. And next well, time I got it here. I got a treat for you. I'm a, Please. An old, old friend I have here. Um, oh my gosh. This was made for me by a guy, uh, a fan, Joshua Snyder, who's a very skilled uh, artist. And uh, and he made this for me. This is in my office right now. Oh! Yeah. How perfect it's, is that? Actual, and the, the eyes light up and everything. Oh. He's got the name tag. Yeah. This is the little placard, beautifully made replica. Uh, and it's to, it's to, it's the exact design. Perfect. I, I got it. this weird box in the mail, you know, about a year ago. And I was like, what the hell is this? A bomb? What's in the box? <laughs> What's in the box? It's me. <laughs> oh, great. Oh, All right. God. Enough about Josh. Let's oh. talk. <laughs> hey, everybody. Guess who's back? Hey, can he say uh, J Jeffrey Peterson on the Letterman podcast? Can he say? <laughs> oh, hi. This is Jeffrey Peterson. And you're listening to the Letterman podcast, even though I was never on Letterman. I think the horse was on Letterman. What a bunch of bullshit. Why did they never invite me? Who cares? Balls. Wow. Very surly, Jeff. Very surly. I could do like a, do like a ventriloquist act. I can tour and tour with uh, oh me God. and Jeff Peterson on the road. Oh, there it is. <laughs> Let's Incredible. shout out the artist again. Who who sent you that? What was his name? A guy named Joshua Snyder. Wow. Good job, yeah. Joshua. Very, yeah. very really awesome. Really great job, buddy. Yeah. It's um and he wrote this, he wrote this incredible letter to this very uh heartfelt letter that uh, you know, just like just like yourself, just sort of telling me how important the show was. And yep. it's like, oh my God, you know. But, you know, it, 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 and then you're talking about living in the moment and, you know, just it's so important to do that. You know, you really because you really don't know, um, you know, you, you know, getting bogged down with worrying about what people think or yep. holding on to the past. And you start to realize it's all bullshit. It's yes. all just it all just goes you know, that's the stuff uh, that clouds you from living in the moment when yeah. the real life is right in the moment. That's where it's like real yeah. and raw and you can do all sorts of things with it. And, and you should, you should, yeah. I think I always tell people to create just to create, like, don't worry about if you get a million views, don't worry about who's reading it or watching it, because if you do that, you know, you're never going to make anything And that. And that is what, you know, that is what stopped. I know. Cause that's what stopped me for a while is like, mm. well, I better, I don't have anything left to say, you know, but I've got a lot more to say. I've got a, tons of things to say. Um, yeah. You know, it'll just be in a, in a different format. One of the cool things now is um, uh, doing like, I mentioned the monster movies I made when I was yep. in eighth grade, seventh, eighth grade. So I'm doing, I've been working on director's cuts of those films. Um, and I had to track down the original vhs camcorder that we used which i found on ebay it was made by ge it's a real real piece of shit speaking of ge and uh uh so you know the legend lives on but um but it, the damn thing works i had it repaired and um so we're i'm shooting all these new insert shots um because there were it's like george lucas director's cut of films i made you know back then but because I've been watching all these shot on video movies, like the Polonia yeah. brothers, I mentioned all these Canadian horror films. There's one called things, which is really, really good. You should tr check that one out. Um, um, I was inspired to do this um, because I would love to have a, a box set, you know, put out by one of my favorite companies, uh, Severin films. They put out all these great movies. Be, be my dream to have a box set of my, childhood films and then my cousins and i we're, i want to make the sequel i want to make like the official sequel that takes place now um using footage of me talking to myself from back then so and my girlfriend oh, is fun a, my girlfriend's a filmmaker and a and an animator and and a, you know she's a, a painter and so 
one of the things she does is she makes these in, incredible miniatures. <laughs> and um, so we we've, we've sort of planned out what we're going to do in terms of miniatures and, um, you know, green screen stuff, but using the technology that would have been available to us in 1987, 1988, you know, so that is, and maybe no one will see it, but it'll be so satisfying to me. It'll fill your heart. The yep. finished version of that. Um, because yeah, the world needs to see these epic, uh, horror films. <laughs> <laughs> I love that you're doing that. Um, yeah. I'm inspired by you today. I hope that like, like that again, this show is exactly what you're talking about. I don't get me wrong. It'd be nice to have some, you know, I would love to be hired by pants one day and all that kind of stuff. That'd be great. Absolutely. They, hey, they'd be fantastic. Uh, will I uh, not do the show or, you know, because there's a possibility? No, I'm doing it because I love it. Yeah. Like yeah. this it's gives important. me more joy. This conversation here gives me more joy uh, that other than take my family out of the equation, then probably anything else I'll be doing this week. And, and wow, um, great. you know, I, I love it. I'm inspired by you. I feel like that is the key to uh, the map uh, to the, where the treasure is buried that so many people overlook. And, and if you can just do something that just wants for, for, for no outcome at all, except for the process of what it is that you want to do. Uh, that is a secret to life, my friend. And I That's really it. am grateful that you have gotten to that place uh, while we're still being able to reminisce about some of the cool shit we've been talking about. Yeah. And, 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 and it's I, okay to, and it's okay to go through that for anybody out there that, yeah. you know, it's, it don't, you know, maybe don't, uh, <laughs> maybe don't do it, uh, you know, publicly as publicly as I did, but, um, but whatever, I mean, you know, social, like I, I, I will say this though, there were a lot of, there were more people than not who did understand. And also because I was going through things and because I was so, open about depression or mm -hmm. struggles in the industry there were a lot more people that you know it, it made things very real to them and and made them feel a little bit more relieved that you know oh we're not the only people going through it so yeah there were some people that weren't particularly nice about it but i think on the whole it was actually a really good thing you know it actually brought people together in an interesting way um but you're right you can have both and I look back on that time with nothing but fond memories. I mean, mm -hmm. there's definitely a book in all that for yep. sure. The, the stories yep. are, there's so many. Um, and maybe, uh, you know, who knows? Maybe um, I'll be chatting soon with uh, Craig in some capacity and you'll and we'll have a sit down chat and everyone will see it. So we'll see. We'll see what happens. Wouldn't that be great? You never know. I never know. Um Josh, you have given way more of your time than we agreed upon from the beginning. But to me, it's just like my heart is full. My soul is full. I've enjoyed this so, so very much. As we kind of move to the end, was there anything else that you wanted to talk about before the next time you come on the show? Or are we? Uh... I mean, I think, what is this, five hours? What are we at? Something, Three hours? Yeah, four, yeah, yeah, something like that. It's been great. <laughs> no, I, you know, we'll, I, I, we'll talk more about, um, you know, horror films and Star Wars and all that stuff. But um, the yeah. George Lucas stuff, uh, I just wanted to say that some of my favorite stuff that I've been a part of recently um, is the work I've done with a guy named uh, Jeff Richards, who has a, he has a podcast called The Jeff Richards Show. Uh, he's an incredible impressionist yeah. and um, comedian. And Jeff will implement deep fake technology to look like the characters, the people that he's doing impressions of, which is what we did with George Lucas for yep. Collider. Yep. Um, that's how I met Jeff Richards. I met him doing a thing called Deep Fake Roundtable, which is really, <laughs> I, to me, if you haven't seen it, people should watch it. It's, it's, it's really the crowning achievement to me of that kind of improv. I, I'd never met any of the people that are in that sketch until that day. And um, such a talented group of folks. And uh, I play Jeff Goldblum and I play George Lucas. So we had to shoot it twice <laughs> so I could be on either side of the table. Um, awesome. And Jeff Richards played uh, Robert Downey Jr. And <laughs> But then I would go on his show as George Lucas and he would interview me. He would be Dustin Hoffman and I would be George Lucas. Oh. And the the <laughs> way just the the conversation would go into this beautifully absurd 
place. Um, very non sequitur kind of bizarre humor that I love so dearly that, that reminds yeah. me of that SCTV kind of, or, or kids in the hall, really this idea yeah. of like, or uh, Monty Python. We're just going to, we're going to yeah. go until we end up in this very surreal place. We don't know how to get out of this sketch. <laughs> so we'll have Terry Gilliam animate a door or step on somebody and then we'll just, you know, yep. but so, <laughs> um, I would urge people to check him out. Um, uh, and those episodes in particular, because I think a lot of that stuff was kind of missed by people. It's very, it, again, it's that's the challenge of telling a certain fan base and they're all great and they're there for one thing. Yeah. But boy, oh boy, I mean, I always joke, I could be in a Marvel movie and the first comment would be, where's Jeff? You know, and it's like, man, no. But that's right. But now, but now I don't, I take it as a, oh, that's nice. You know, it's before yeah. it was like, don't you care about anything else I do? <laughs> Not really. Um, <laughs> but that, but that kind of stuff. And um, I don't know, podcast. I mean, I did a podcast with my buddy, John Mariano yep. years ago. Now, John is a, another legend who uh, was, on, you know, he's on Animaniacs as well. He was uh, uh, Bobby Pigeon. He was, you know, part of the, the good feathers uh crew has <laughs> been in, he's been in a ton of other shows but he and i did like an old timey radio podcast called the poking around podcast and each episode they were like mini comedy albums most of that stuff we probably our, our careers would be decimated if uh that was out in the world but you know um but i'd like to get back to doing that kind of stuff but you'll definitely see the reverend apostle bg uh good. very he will be uh -huh. back and he will be back to bless you. But this time, man, you know, this show, I don't know what this is. These Canadian people are so, they're so twisted. They got the guy, who's the guy, the leader, the blackface guy. What's that guy's name? <laughs> Bill, please. Bill, please. Who cares, man? I don't even care anymore. But I will return those of you who did not care for me, those who denounced me. Those who said this guy's washed up, I yes, I did some prison time, but now I'm on parole and back to say some things in a very sanitized way so as not to offend anybody. All groups are welcome. When we write books now, you have to write it for every single group. You can't, you cannot leave anybody out, Josh. Okay, Bill. Thanks. Anyway, Bill Green, Apostle BG. That's all I got. I'm trying We're ending to get right there. Four hours. We're yeah. ending right there. All right. That's uh, enough. <laughs> Josh Robert Thompson. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Yeah, you're getting claps from the room here. Thank you so much for this. This has been uh, another episode of the of the Letterman podcast uh, with Mike Chisholm. Coincidentally, I am Mike Chisholm. Thank you and good night. Overcoat and underpants.